So hey guys, welcome back to my channel. This is part 1. What if Naruto and Itachi both got harem in fairy tale? Yes, you guys heard right, Naruto and Itachi both are going to get a harem in fairy tale world in this fanfic. But before I start, I request you guys. Leave a like and press the bell icon so that you will not miss the next part whenever I upload. And also check out my playlist. Let's start the story. Peace. It was all Itachi Ichiha had ever wanted. He was but a small child during the third great ninja war that had claimed so many lives, including that of the fourth Hokage. Had Minato Namikaze survived, the tragedy that befell the Ichihas might have been avoided. Years later, Itachi died fighting for his village and protecting them as a double agent of the Akatsuki, while always making sure that his baby brother was alive and strong. He had tried to make Sasuke hate him because he thought that hate made one stronger. That was the Ichiha mentality after all. He was wrong. He had only made his brother full of misdirected rage. An unusual twist of fate brought Itachi back to life, and he was able to help the allied shinobi nations against the threat of his ancestors in Kabuto. He defeated the latter with the assistance of his little brother that he sacrificed so much for. It was the only time they'd fought alongside one another and he cherished the memory. When Itachi Ichiha had gone to the grave for the second time, it had been done with a clear conscience and a world-weary soul. He'd helped those still living in the world in the fourth great ninja war and would now have his much-deserved peace. He had never been one for religion. Though he did believe in the philosophy of Buddhism, he found a certain sense of connection with the beliefs of Shintoism, given a ninja's affiliation for the elements. This wasn't the first time he died, so when he left the mortal realm for the second time after he'd done what he could in the war, he fully expected to experience the blissful oblivion of solitude and peace. What he did not expect was to be standing before a massive presence known as the Spirit King. Itachi Ichiha, welcome to the afterlife again, the Spirit King greeted him. I am king of the spirit world. The spirit world king had a mind-blowing amount of chakra, and while his bushy beard might have made him appear genial, it seemed more like a broom to sweep up the mess of his meals. Itachi had to wonder just what he ate. The souls of the dead, perhaps. Sir, Itachi replied coolly. He stood with a relaxed posture and pushed aside his worries. One does not live their life as a double agent in the most dangerous mercenary group without being able to stand on their own. If this giant creature attacked him, he'd find out its weakness and respond accordingly. Your analytical mind is as impressive as I had hoped, the spirit king said in a booming voice. I can read your thoughts, Itachi. You have had a hard life, made very difficult choices, and struggled to protect both your village and your loved ones. When your two loyalties were in direct opposition you chose duty and to be honorable. I am here to judge you, the spirit king declared. Itachi frowned at the man's words. He was a master at masking his emotions, but his very thoughts. The task was impossible. Judgment. Itachi echoed with a raised eyebrow. Thoughts continued to swirl in his mind, ripe for plucking by this mysterious being. He didn't recall being judged by anyone when he died the first time just peaceful oblivion. This is unlike your first death, the Spirit King said, answering Itachi's unspoken thought. And what have you found, Spirit King? Itachi asked. The massive king began to laugh, the sound shook the very ground, making it difficult to remain standing. With every generation of man, I see if there was one individual soul that stands out amongst his or her brethren. And that soul is given an opportunity to become a celestial spirit. It has been many centuries since I have found a soul to which I could make this offer, Itachi Ichiha. Itachi calculated his options, thinking many thoughts at once, hoping to confuse the mind-reading deity. He doubted if he could put such a creature into a Jinjutsu. Most likely a giant fireball wouldn't do him any good either. He was in an unknown environment, so escape might be impossible. What was so spectacular about my life that makes you want to extend to me this offer? The spirit king began to laugh again. So humble. I told you that I can read your mind, but I can also read your heart. You believe you only did what any capable shinobi would have done. I can tell you that your actions are what saved your world from the tyranny of your uncles. Naruto Uzumaki would have been captured in his youth before his training could be completed if it had not been for you protecting him from the Akatsuki. He, your brother whom you also spared in that massacre, their female teammate and their leader a former teammate of yours while you were in Anbu, were the quartet of ninjas most responsible for ending the fourth great ninja war. Itachi was proud to hear that his brother was included in the four that had stopped the war. Perhaps they would help usher in the era of peace amongst the shinobi. He thought of Naruto and Sakura Sasuke's old teammates, along with Kakashi his friend from long ago. He was glad that they had never given up on his wayward little brother. I am glad to hear of this outcome, Itachi said. You have proven yourself time and again as a great protector. My offer to you is to make you into the celestial spirit of the crow. And after all the years of heartbreak, you may cast aside the name of Itachi Ichiha and be known as Reaper. A Shinigami? A Reaper of Death? Itachi asked. 
No, no, the spirit king said waving aside the idea with a casual flip of his hand. You will work with a celestial spirit mage in battle. You will continue to protect those around you with your powers. You will become part of the celestial spirit world. So I will not join the resting home of my ancestors? Itachi asked. His thoughts went to his mother, father, and best friend Shisui. The spirit king shook his head. No, you will be a protector spirit from now until the end of days. Time between this world and that of the living passes differently. If that was the case, how much time had already passed between his second death and now? I must know, is Sasuke still alive? Itachi asked. Yes. And if you associate yourself with a spirit mage, it is possible that you will cross paths with him and his friends again. You will be tied to the life of that mage and his or her timeline. It would give him a chance to see what sort of life his brother made for himself. However, it was time Itachi stopped living his life for the sake of his little brother. Do I get to choose this mage? Your key will be very powerful. As in life where you were able to overcome evil influences, if you do not accept your master any contract you make with them will be null and void. This is an unique trait that you will possess. You will be too powerful of a celestial spirit to fall into the hands of a madman. And power breeds madness. Itachi could agree to that last assessment. He'd seen plenty of powerful shinobi succumb to madness. There had been times when he'd worried about it himself. Clear goals and a well-defined sense of duty kept him from losing his mind. Do you have a mage in mind then, Spirit King? As a matter of fact, I do. She's a very promising wizard. She already possesses most of the zodiac keys. Her spirits love her and consider her a friend. And unlike most spirit mages she values the health of her spirits and doesn't treat them as tools. Does she have a name? Itachi pressed. She is a member of the Fairy Tale Guild and her name is Lucy Hertfilia. She and her teammates will soon be facing tribulation on an epic scale and she will need the help of Reaper the Spirit of Death from the Gate of the Crow, the Spirit King explained. I don't suppose she might utilize the assistance of her nearby ninja clans, Itachi murmured. You could suggest it to her, but once you see her teammates you might find that unnecessary. Have you made your choice, Itachi? Call me Reaper, Itachi decided. Now let's jump into the fairy tales world too. In Fiori, a land to the far west of Earthland was the city of Magnolia. It was the home of the fairy tale guild, a family of mages that believed love and friendship were far more important than power and wealth. Within that guild of talented warriors, Team Natsu was declared the strongest. It was a team of five that consisted of a powerful woman named Titania, a celestial spirit mage with contracts and strong friendships with most of the zodiacs, an exceed, and two male rivals a fire dragon slayer and an ice mage with demon slayer abilities. Jobs taken by this team had a 100% completion rating, but the amount of damages inflicted during the jobs often negated the large payments. Trust me, it's going to be fine, Gray promised with a confident smile. He grasped Lucy's wrist and pulled her forcefully towards the stream that ran near the guild hall. He glanced over his shoulder at her and eyed her up and down from her oversized purple sweater down to her knee-high brown leather boots. You wore your swimsuit, right? Yes, under my outfit I wore my swimsuit, Lucy scowled. She was nervous about their practice. Juvia was already waiting, looking forward to Gray's request to practice ice magic with her, not realizing that he'd meant to include Lucy in their sparring session. Juvia is expecting a one-on-one -on -one practice with you Gray. She doesn't want me there, Lucy protested. She tried to pull her arm out of his grip, but Gray merely tightened his hold. She already thinks we're rivals for your love. I really don't want her trying to kill me again, Lucy complained, digging her heels into the ground and halting their progress. You're my teammate Lucy. Not her. Gray turned to face Lucy, hooking his finger under her chin to make her look up and meet his navy blue gaze. Loke says that you're the best celestial spirit mage, and that's no small praise coming from the king of the zodiacs, considering that he's been around for a long time. But, now you hold a huge responsibility with Aquarius's water powers. You're a member of Fairy Tale's strongest team. You have to learn to master all your abilities. He released her chin and pinched her nose between his thumb and index finger teasingly. No more arguing. Besides, if you master water magic I won't need to team up with Juvia so often. You and I can handle more jobs, and it will be even easier to keep up with your rent. Lucy brushed away his hand in annoyance. She walked alongside Gray and hoped for the best. At least if Gray was there, Juvia wouldn't actually try to hurt her. She'd be too afraid of disappointing her Gray Sama. It wasn't that Lucy was against learning how to use her new water mage skills, but every time she tried to use them, she was reminded of the loss of her oldest friend, Aquarius. At least when she was feeling sad, a rain cloud didn't form over her head. Gray Sama. Juvia exclaimed, her eyes bright with little red hearts as she clasped her hands together over her chest. Her expression darkened immediately upon spying Lucy at Gray's side. What are you doing here? She sneered, her eyes narrowed in annoyance. 
Hi Juvia. Lucy smiled brightly and tried to ignore her friend's anger. Gray told me about how you are the absolute best with water mage magic and that he hoped you could give me some pointers so that I'm not a complete liability to the team. Juvia's expression softened and she turned to Gray eagerly. You think I'm the absolute best, Gray Sama. Gray nodded solemnly. I wouldn't trust anyone else with this important mission. The hearts reappeared in Juvia's eyes. Well, if it's for you, of course, Gray Sama. Though, I thought you wanted to practice some moves with me for the missions that are best suited for us. Ice and water magic work well together, Gray answered, tugging on his shirt collar nervously. I was hoping that between the two of us, we could help Lucy become more comfortable with her new abilities. And since Natsu is my mission partner, it would be nice if I could help manage some of the damage control against his fire, Lucy added. It gets expensive. She thought about her last mission with Natsu. He'd burned down a priceless tapestry while managing to apprehend a trio of dark guild mages that had kidnapped their client's young daughter. The client had been overjoyed about the return of his daughter, but they'd received no payment for their job in order to cover the damages. Juvia smiled at Grey once more before turning her attention to Lucy. Okay, rival, not all elemental magic is the same. As you may have noticed Grey Sama creates inanimate objects from his ice magic while Lion makes creatures. The same can be true with water. I am made of water, so I do not need a supply of water to make my magic happen. You too are made of water. Humans are composed primarily of the element. Um, well, when Aquarius was summoned, she needed to have a water source nearby. I would assume that I would need that as well, Lucy said. She tried not to cringe at imagining herself turning into a puddle of water like she'd seen Juvia do before. It creeped her out. Juvia tapped her chin thoughtfully and cast a sly look towards Grey. We should change into swimsuits. What? Why? Lucy panicked. It wasn't that she had a problem wearing a swimsuit, but her and Gray's track records for losing articles of clothing during battle, it might be better to start off with more clothing. I have my swimsuit under my clothes. Isn't that good enough? Juvia stripped off her conservative dress and stood in a skimpy pale blue bikini. Lucy caught the curve of Gray's lips. With a sigh, Lucy removed her boots, skirt and sweater, revealing her red bikini. Gray's grin turned wolfish, and suddenly his shirt was missing. Can you mold the water from the stream? Juvia asked. Lucy bit her lip and concentrated. She could feel the presence of the water, and she held her hands out in front of her. A sphere of water shifted from the stream to be spun in a ball between her hands. Lucy looked up and met Juvia's critical eye, and the water splashed into a huge mess soaking her chest. Juvia sighed. This is going to take some time. Lucy grit her teeth in frustration. It was going to be a long day. A warm hand fell upon Lucy's bare shoulder. You ladies keep at it, Gray and I will work on some moves just a little ways away, Loke said with a charming smile. He adjusted his glasses and inspected first Lucy and then Juvia's bikini-clad bodies. Not too far, mind you. Gray grabbed Loke's elbow and yanked him away. Just call when you're ready to practice some ice-water combinations. Your lion spirit is a bit of a pervert, Juvia commented. Not so much a pervert as a womanizer. He's a real gentleman when it suits him, Lucy explained. Juvia wasn't part of the fairy tale guild back when Loke masqueraded as a regular human mage. It was weeks after Lucy joined that it was revealed he was a celestial spirit. He was avoiding the spirit world, worried about the consequences of his former master passing away after he refused to answer her summons. Lucy had intervened on his behalf and begged the spirit king to forgive Loke. She'd saved his life and he was one of her best friends ever since. Not to mention, he was her strongest zodiac spirit Leo, king of the zodiacs. From what I remember of Aquarius, she mostly just swept away problems in a massive tsunami, Juvia said. That's about right, Lucy answered. Let's work on refining your aim first then. The next three hours were spent training. As time progressed, with Grey engaged in a sparring match with Loke and ignoring the two women, Juvia began to focus less on trying to impress Grey and actually on instructing Lucy. Lucy held up her hand. I need to take a break, she said. She collapsed onto the water-saturated ground and laid on her back breathing heavily. Loke approached her while Grey spoke with Juvia to ask about her progress. Lucy barely looked over towards her zodiac spirit when he crouched next to her. His lips were pressed tightly together and his eyes were worried behind his glasses. Is something wrong? Lucy asked. There has been a surge of celestial power in the spirit world, Loke answered. I'm not sure what it means, but with the loss of Aquarius, it could mean that another celestial spirit was created. Another Aquarius. Lucy sat up and groaned as a muscle in her mid-back seized up and spasmed. Loke laid his hand upon her bare back and he began to absently massage the tense muscle. You're dehydrated, he murmured. This is why Aquarius always used a nearby source of water. It's too dangerous to attempt water magic without a ready supply. If the spell is too great, you might take too much water from your own body. 
the discomfort eased under his touch. And no, not like Aquarius. This feels like something different. Like a zodiac spirit, but not. He rubbed his brow with his free hand. I don't know. You should go check it out then, Lucy encouraged. She glanced towards Juvia and Grey. The water mage currently had her hands on Grey's shoulders and was leaning close. The tips of Grey's ears were bright red. I'm not really sure I should leave you alone with those two, Loke said, following her gaze. He moved his hand away from Lucy's back. I've had enough practice. I'm heading home anyway. Lucy stood and brushed a few blades of grass off the back of her legs and then slipped back on her skirt and sweater. Want me to walk you home? Loke asked. That would be excellent, Lucy agreed. She picked up her boots and frowned. Her wet skin was going to ruin the leather. Why don't I carry you? Loke offered. Before Lucy could protest, he swept her into his arms. She let out a little cry of surprise and fumbled her boots until she had them pressed against her chest. Hey Gray. I'm taking Lucy home. Loke called out before breaking into a run towards the residential portion of the city, ignoring Gray's shout to wait. Lucy clutched onto the front of Loke's green fur-lined jacket, keeping the boots as a barrier between her big BB and his chest. It was kind of nice and chivalrous to be carried back to her apartment. Though, it would have been nice if maybe a boyfriend had carried her and not a womanizing celestial spirit. Lucy was exhausted both physically and mentally by the time Loke dropped her off outside of her apartment. He popped back into the spirit world and she trudged inside her front door. Her clothes were soaking wet and her hair clung to her face in drenched tangles. She dumped her boots next to the entrance and closed and locked the door behind her. She marched straight toward her bed with every intention of going straight to sleep. At least it was the plan, until she realized her bed was occupied. What are you doing? Lucy demanded, gripping her pillow and hitting her intruder on the head with it. Get out. Natsulade stretched out on his back on top of her bed. He caught the pillow, opened his dark eyes, and frowned. Why are you all wet? He set aside the pillow and scratched the back of his head, mussing his pink hair. Training session, Lucy answered tiredly. What are you doing in my apartment? In my bed. Your apartment is so much cleaner than mine, he said. And happy is with Wendy and Carla and I was bored. I thought I'd just take a nap and wait for you to come home. Okay. Lucy sat on the edge of her bed and cradled her head in her hands. She had a terrible headache forming at her temples. All she wanted to do was go to sleep and wake up next week. How did you get in here? The chimney, Natsu said. He sat up, yanked off Lucy's oversized sweater, and tossed it to the floor where it landed in a wet plop. Lucy squealed in surprise as a chill rushed over her damp skin. Natsu laid his hands on Lucy's bare shoulders, and warmth washed over her body drying her skin. You need to take care of yourself. Um, Lucy murmured laying back on her bed, not caring that she wore only her bikini and a slightly damp miniskirt. She closed her eyes. Just don't hug the covers. I'm too tired to kick you out. Natsu picked up a discarded pillow and set it under Lucy's head. He then reached for the pink comforter and wrapped it around their bodies. His elevated body temperature quickly heated up the cocoon he'd formed around Lucy, and she fell into an exhausted slumber. Sure thing, Lucy, he agreed. Far to the east of Earthland was home to the five great shinobi countries. The villages of rock, sand, leaf, cloud, and mist had in recent years allied together in the fourth great ninja war. Three years had passed since the defeat of the Akatsuku mercenary band and their leaders Madara and Abito Uchiha. Sakura reached up and adjusted her Anbu mask. It was really quite useless for her to wear it. Just how many pink-haired Kanoichi were there in Kanoha. It wasn't like her identity was truly hidden. She glanced to her side to where her teammates Naruto and Sai kneeled next to her. Naruto's identity was just as obvious as hers with his bright yellow blonde hair. They were waiting for the Hokage, who was late as usual, to present their report. It had been 20 minutes since they had started kneeling before his desk. Sakura suspected that he did this to them purposely. An exercise in patience that was only serving to annoy his former teammates. Shikamaru leaned against the far wall looking impatient as he kept stealing glances at his wristwatch and sighing repeatedly. Eventually, the back door to the office opened and Kakashi, the sixth Hokage, stumbled out with his nose stuck in a dog-eared copy of Itcha Itcha Tactics. Oh, hey, I didn't realize you had already arrived. He smiled at them, his matching charcoal gray eyes crinkled at the corners, while the rest of his face was hidden behind his ever-present black mask. Naruto grunted, Sai remained silent, and Sakura glared at him with all the annoyance she could muster in her gaze. Kakashi met her eyes and visibly swallowed. He snapped shut his book and shoved it into the inside pocket of his hokage robes. Just trying to keep it light. Carry on our tradition. I had to help an old feeble woman cross the street. Shikamaru snorted. I did. Lady Tsunade was quite drunk. If I hadn't helped her she might have passed out on the street. Kakashi protested. Our mission went as expected, Sakura stated, ignoring Kakashi's blatant lie. 
She knew for a fact that Lady Tsunade was at the hospital on her afternoon rounds. She held out the mission report she'd written that morning. Sai had sent Kakashi a preliminary report four nights before as they made their return trek from the northeastern border of Lightning back to Kanoha. Very good, Kakashi said, taking the scroll from her hand without bothering to read it. He handed it to Shikamaru, who sighed again and then read through it. You can stand, he said, gesturing for them to rise. Sakura rose smoothly to her feet, ignoring the uncomfortable pins and needles sensation from sitting in the same position for so long. Kakashi leaned against the edge of his desk and peered at them, his hand reaching for the book inside his robes. Has there been any word? Naruto asked, his voice laced with impatience. Kakashi shook his head and brought his hand back to his side. Not since the sighting six months ago at the far western provinces of the Earth Country. Though, it's been chaotic there since the death of the Tsuchikage. Sakura's hand fisted against her thigh. Sasuke had left the village a couple of months after the conclusion of the Great War with a clean slate and a new forehead protector. He'd apologized to her and Naruto and promised that he'd return home soon. During the month-long interlude when he had been reintroduced to Konoha and they'd gone on several dates. She thought that maybe they'd finally be the couple she'd always dreamed of. Then he'd left to atone for his sins. She'd received a couple of letters his first year away, but nothing since. Now, who's interested in joining me for a dinner at Ichiraku Raymond? Kakashi asked. Great idea, Kakashi-sensei. Naruto shouted enthusiastically. He's just trying to get a free meal out of us, Sakura grumbled. Kakashi smiled at her words, validating her suspicion. You're well paid, high-ranking Anbu, Kakashi pointed out. Put on some civilian clothes. I'll meet you there. He vanished from his office with a puff of smoke. Shikamaru groaned. I hate when he does that. I already saw to it that your pay was deposited in your respective banks. He looked at his watch again. Tamari will be waiting for me at home. Take tomorrow to recuperate and I'll see you in two days with your next assignment. It was an unusual land compared to any that Itachi had visited during his mortal life. There were areas of lush green forest with crystal clear streams that reminded him of Kanoha. The trees in this foreign land were much taller and much older than the ones from his youth. The sky was usually blue, but today it was a pale amethyst color. Colorful wildflowers blanketed the hills, and if he were to run his fingertips over the petals, the flowers would transform into butterflies and flutter away. It was just so pretty, and while he preferred the dark colors of black and crimson, he could appreciate the rich variety of colors in the foreign land. He spent most of his time in this tranquil region of forest land. Everywhere he went crows followed, never far away. They served as his familiars. Through their eyes, he could see kilometers into the distance and unlike mortal crows, these could see in color. Strange creatures roamed the land that he'd only read about when he was a young boy in one of Shisui's old illustrated children's books. Fawns with their golden fur-lined lower goat-like bodies, human torsos, and heads with tiny horns, played music on their flutes in the distance and danced amongst the trees and fields of flowers. At least half of the trees were tree nymphs. Willowy women that transformed into trees. The springs led to a great lagoon that was full of mermaids and mermen. He watched as they played games and leapt above the water's surface, doing flips with the rainbow scales of their lower bodies, catching the sun's light. When he first arrived near the stream, he sensed a summer atmosphere around the mer people. Since his arrival, it was as if a dark cloud lifted and they began to play. He envied their frivolity. He concentrated on communicating with his crow familiars. While he was stuck in this strange land, perhaps they would be able to pass the barrier between the spirit world and the mortal human world. Four crows had flown off in the cardinal directions looking for a passage between the worlds. So far, they had brought him nothing but more images of the spirit world and creatures of the likes he'd never even imagined. Itachi felt no hunger and no thirst. Breathing was a simple matter, and his lungs were no longer constricted by the scar tissue and disease that had plagued him the last decade of his life. He could hear the shifting of grass behind him. Using the observations of his familiars, he watched as a man with fiery orange hair, blue glasses, and a black suit approached. The crows whispered in Itachi's mind. King of the Zodiacs. Mind if I sit here? Itachi watched him closely. This king of the Zodiacs didn't appear hostile. Suit yourself, Itachi answered. He turned his attention back to the fawns across the stream, while using his familiars to keep their attention on the newcomer. It has been a long time since the spirit king created a new celestial spirit. You must have been someone special. He held out his hand. I'm Leo, king of the zodiacs. You can call me Lok, if you like. Itachi turned his head towards Leo and eyed his hand warily. He sensed no threat, but he didn't shake his hand. It was a foreign custom he never cared for too much disease could be spread through such casual touch. With his weak lungs in life, it hadn't been worth the risk. Reaper. Leo's eyebrows arched up in surprise. Your parents named you Reaper. He retracted his hand slowly and rubbed his palm over the thigh of his pants leg. 
Itachi chuckled in genuine amusement, the sensation rarely felt in recent years. Usually he reserved his laughter for unnerving opponents. No, they did not. It is my current name though given to me by the Spirit King. Ah, don't want to talk about your old life. That's understandable. Most of us don't remember much about our mortal lives, Leo said. He looped his arms around one of his knees and followed Itachi's gaze towards the fawns. The hoofed creatures continued their music, though many had stopped dancing and were now lounging against the trees. I remember everything. Itachi closed his eyes briefly and ignored the lump of emotion that rose up in his throat. His life had been scarred by countless tragedy, but the idea of forgetting about who he was and why he sacrificed so much was truly frightening. Suffering had become part of his identity. Aries, she's another zodiac, noticed you've been in this area for the past couple of days. Said you hadn't moved much. Are you hungry? Leo held out his hand, and an assortment of nuts and berries were gathered in his palm. I feel no hunger here. Itachi glanced towards the people, but since Leo's arrival, they dived back under the water's surface. Time runs different between here and the human world. The question was how different. With his Tsukiyomi he had manipulated time for his victims. What felt like years of torture would pass for them, while in reality only seconds to minutes would have elapsed. Leo waved his hand and the food vanished. That would be problematic if he had hopes of reuniting with Sasuke or at least checking on his little brother's progress. Is it possible to wander the human world without a contract and unbidden? So far, I am the only one who has managed such a feat, Leo confessed. Some of my fellow Zodiacs have been able to summon themselves to the human world when our contractual celestial spirit mage was in danger. Perhaps his familiars wouldn't be able to find their way into the human world until he'd been summoned. Were there consequences to remaining in the human world? Itachi's crows spotted the arrival of two others, slightly inferior in strength to Leo. One was a giant bull with a huge axe balanced across his shoulder, and the other a pink-haired woman in a maid's uniform with chains shackled upon her wrists. After a while my essence started to fade. I had been afraid to return to the spirit world and face the spirit king. He can be a rather intimidating guy. Leo glanced over his shoulder. Do you mind if some of my friends join us? Why were you afraid to face the king? The spirit king had been intimidating, but he hadn't seemed malicious. Had you broken a law? Leo's eyes were downcast, and he took a deep breath to steady himself. I made it so my contractual human mage wasn't able to call more spirits to help her in battle. She was cruel to her spirits and treated them without respect. She considered us slaves rather than allies. Itachi thought about Lord Danzo and of his own father, the head of the Achiha clan. They both treated their subordinates as tools and had both been murdered for their actions. Sasuke's defeat of the root leader was the best thing he could have done for Konoha. At least some good had come from his brother's madness. Some people must die so that others may live, Itachi said. He stood, rising in one fluid motion, his dark cloak billowed behind him. This Leo might prove to be a useful ally if Itachi were to find a way back to the mortal world. I will meet these friends of yours, but not here. Let us leave these creatures to their merriment. Leo glanced towards the people, whom had returned to the lagoon's surface to play more games. I am glad to see they no longer mourn the loss of Aquaria so keenly. For the last few days, they have sung their songs of melancholy. They started towards the outer border of the forested area where the other zodiacs waited. A pink-haired woman with ram horns had joined the other pair. Were all the female celestial spirits pink-haired? He only knew of one person with pink hair before the female on Sasuke's genin team. Who is Aquarius? Queen of the people. She recently sacrificed herself in battle in order to summon the Spirit King to the human world. I think because of her loss, the Spirit King was able to offer you such power to keep the spiritual energy balanced. Leo looked at Tachi up and down with an appraising eye. You might just have more spirit energy than me. The Zodiac spirits prepared a banquet for Itachi. While he wasn't hungry, the food and drinks were delicious. It was a pleasant surprise to learn that while food was unnecessary, it could still be enjoyed. He realized the spirit world had nearly infinite spirits aside from the zodiacs. A young woman named Lyra played the harp and sang soothing music throughout the meal. Strange white dog-like creatures with golden horn noses scampered about his feet carrying trays filled with more food. You should let me style your hair, E.B. Cancer, the crab-like spirit offered. He sat catty corner to Itachi at the long table. He eagerly snapped several pairs of scissors in his hands. Itachi resisted the urge to pat down his hair and reassure himself that his long hair was still intact. Don't mind him. Virgo, the maiden, placed another goblet of wine in front of Itachi. He prides himself on his styling skills. It's his way of expressing his hospitality. She sat across from Itachi, her chains jingling with the movement. What do you think of the spirit world, Reaper? It's crowded, Itachi answered. He wasn't a wine enthusiast, but even he could appreciate the deep, rich flavor of his drink. His gaze swept across the banquet table. 
Everyone, save a man with half red and half white hair and a scorpion tail, seemed to be enjoying themselves. Itachi had been perceptive to the pain of others during life, but since the introduction to his new spiritual existence, he could sense when the weight of death lingered around someone. The scorpion had a dark aura around him even greater than what haunted the mer people. Leo leaned close to Itachi's ear on his right. He's Aquarius's boyfriend, Scorpio, Leo explained. She could be a difficult woman, but to him she was the most devoted and loving girlfriend. He has taken her loss very hard. What happens to a spirit that dies? Itachi asked quietly. No one knows, Ares answered. Well, I mean, I'm sure the spirit king knows, but no one dares ask him. So are you all bound to the same spirit mage? Itachi scanned the table once more taking account of the number of zodiac spirits. Each possessed traits of their namesakes Leo, Ares, Virgo, Taurus, Gemini, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Cancer, and Scorpio. Lucy held the contract to ten of the zodiacs, Leo said. Aquarius was her mother's key and Lucy's first contract. He started to shred the roll of bread on his plate. Most of us found her after she defeated our previous masters. I was actually part of her guild, masquerading as a human. Itachi recognized the name from his conversation with the spirit king. Though, if she was the kind girl these spirits claimed her to be, he doubted she'd have much use for a harvester of death like him. And the other zodiacs. There are twelve. Yukino Guria of Sabretooth is a great friend and ally to Lucy, Scorpio said from his end of the table. It was the first time since meeting him that Itachi heard the Somber Man speak. She has three zodiacs, bringing the number of zodiac spirits to thirteen. Yukino has contracts with Pisces, Libra, and Ephiachus, Leo said. Ephiachus is a mystery to us. So, you see, you aren't the only scary new key. Leo shuddered and ran his hands up and down his arms. Ephiachus is a giant serpent with fangs longer than even Taurus. My suggestion to you, Reaper, is to seek out Curmudgeon. He goes by Crux. He sleeps a lot these days, but he's very old and very knowledgeable. If you have any questions, he would be your best resource, Ares suggested. Thank you, Itachi said, dipping his head in acknowledgement. The ram's cheeks burned bright pink, and she ducked her head to the side to avoid his eyes. Virgo braced her elbows against the table and leaned towards Itachi. Your eyes are fascinating, Reaper. They burn with a crimson light with a kaleidoscope of onyx in constant rotation. Itachi closed his eyes and felt the familiar chakra drain of his Sharingan. He shut down his bloodline gift, and when he opened his eyes again they were a dark onyx. Better. Virgo frowned. There was nothing wrong, just interesting. She shrugged and then leaned back. If you tire of those depressing clothes I can create a lovely wardrobe for you. She turned to Taurus. I have holes to dig, will you assist? Horus pushed back his chair and lifted his axe. Let's move it. Leo tugged on his shirt sleeves. He wore a dark elegantly tailored suit. You should take Virgo up on her offer for a wardrobe. She can make apparel that will cause even the most spoiled prince or princess to be jealous with envy. It is not my mission to make envious royals, Itachi said, crinkling his nose and thinking about the daimyo's spoiled children. He felt a strange tugging sensation in the pit of his stomach. Leo was suddenly alert. I think you're being summoned, he explained, clapping his hand over Itachi's shoulder. Remember, when you make a contract, you must be very specific. Consider even the most minute details. Good luck. As Itachi entered the mysterious void, Leo's words rang hollow in his mind. Open gate of the crow spirit of death reaper. A voice called out. Itachi felt himself shift dimensions. His body transformed from his human form into a murder of crows. A hooded figure stood in a wasteland with ash covering the ground below him and blackened trees charcoaled by some recent fire. The man held an onyx key obviously not the girl mage Lucy he had been told about. The crows assembled themselves and Itachi stood before a tall, pale man. Itachi resumed the form he had as a human shinobi of the leaf. However, instead of his black and red cloud Akatsuki robes, he wore a plain black cloak. His underclothes were the same fishnet and black that he wore in life, including the three-circle necklace from Shisui he used to wear. You called? Itachi asked in a bland, emotionless tone. I wish to make a contract with you, Reaper, the pale man said. He pushed back his hood with thin, bony fingers withered with age. His pale gray eyes sunk deep into his face. No contract, Itachi said firmly. What would you have me do? I may do it without the necessity of a contract. He communicated silently with his familiars that had followed him into the human world. The four that he had sent to explore the spirit world remained there, but plenty more had followed him into this world during his summons. He sent four more out in search of his brother, Sasuke. I need to have you destroy these abominations, the man said, gesturing around him. Itachi observed the field and was mildly impressed by the amount of undead creatures surrounding them. Most seemed to be humans long dead with stark white bones and grey flesh sloughing off. 
Some were crawling, some were staggering, and others were tearing apart a herd of goats along unblemished sides of a nearby mountain, spared from the ravages of a recent fire. What are these things? The problem, Reaper. I need you to drag them back to hell. The old man hacked a phlegmy cough and wiped the back of his hand across his mouth. A trickle of blood fell from the corner of his mouth. Itachi's eyes narrowed. What were the limits of his new powers as a celestial spirit? His name was Reaper, surely he could read them. They didn't appear to be alive, but they were still moving. Are they undead? Yes, they are undead. Now make them dead dead. The man cried, coughing once more. He waved his hand in front of his nose. Blast this smoke. Did you draw them here? Itachi asked as the creatures continued to close the distance between them and the pale man that would be his master. They are going to kill me. The man pleaded. All right, Itachi said. He broke apart to form a murder of crows again. He penetrated the hearts of the creatures, but nothing happened. They continued to stagger on. Their heads. The man shouted impatiently. Itachi resisted the urge to knock off the old man's head. He directed his attacks to penetrate the undead creature's skulls, hitting on where their frontal lobe would have been. That seemed to work. As soon as they were attacked, the creatures hit the ground in a pile of useless fragmented bones and rotting flesh. He then focused on the undead that were attacking the goats. Most of the animals were ripped to pieces, but a few survived. The pale man fell to the ground and clutched at his heart. Itachi reformed in front of him. He could see a dark aura about the man. The Shroud of Death. It was different than the dark aura that had been around the merpeople and Scorpio. The great chill fell upon the air. Itachi looked up to see a creature with dark wings stand before him with a massive amount of chakra that made his old teammate kiss him seem pathetic. What are you doing? Itachi asked. I have come to collect, the creature said. Who are you? He was almost certain the angel of death stood before him a shinigami of unimaginable power. There weren't other beings he could think of that would have large feathered wings and yet appear humanoid. The Tengu were more canine-like in form. You know who I am, Death answered, his voice was like a resonant echo in a great cave. I don't think I'm going to let you take him just yet. I went through a great deal of trouble to stop these undead creatures from killing him, Itachi said. He drew his sword from the scabbard across his back. He wasn't sure where the sword came from because it hadn't been there a moment ago. It was almost an exact replica of the sword he had in life. The dark angel before him also drew a sword and mirrored Itachi's fighting stance. Who are you to stop death? I'm the Reaper, Itachi said. The dark angel put his sword back into his sheath, seemingly uninterested in fighting now. Reaper. We will meet again, he promised. He looked down at the pale man clutching his chest. He doesn't have long, even if he doesn't die now. Itachi followed death's gaze. His eyes used a power different from the Sharingan, and he could see the cancer raging within the man, corrupting the very marrow of his bones. No, but he doesn't have to die yet. He looked back up at death and swallowed nervously. The Shinigami's essence was a chaotic depth of intensity that stretched eternal before and after time began. The Spirit King was an intimidating presence, but death was terrifying. Very well, for now I will heed your request, death said before he vanished in a swirl of black feathers. What did I get myself into? Itachi wondered as he helped the pale, sickly man to his feet. A toast to the Hokage and his personal Anbu team. Naruto cheered, holding out a cup of sake. Sakura, Sai, and Kakashi touched their cups against his. Kampai. Sakura drank with her teammates and then set aside her cup to focus on her bowl of ramen. Her gaze drifted towards Naruto's prosthetic right arm. He used his right hand with ease and not for the first time, she wondered if Sasuke was as adept with his prosthetic arm. He'd left the village shortly after Tsunade had fitted it for him. When I put this team together, it was only to last for four years serving as liaisons to the other hidden ninja villages. Three of those years are up, Kakashi said. He pointed his chopsticks at Naruto. You need to start your training for the role of Hokage. He then angled his chopsticks at Sakura. And Tsunade wants to teach you about running the hospital full time. And finally, he angled his chopsticks at Sai. And I recommend you start planning that wedding of yours with Ino before she becomes violent. All three of them groaned. It wasn't that Sakura wasn't looking forward to working at the hospital full time. It was her ultimate goal, but she wasn't quite ready to settle down to such a routine life. For the past three years, their Anbu team had helped their allied shinobi villages search for rebel factions that weren't pleased with the alliance. Sakura had taught both Naruto and Sai non-lethal methods of taking out their opponents. They would use pressure points to render an opponent helpless. With Naruto's speed, most of the opposition would be out cold before Sakura or Sai even arrived on scene. Okay, but we have a whole other year, Naruto pointed out. And I'm not spending it stuck here babysitting a bunch of genin while they chase cats in some lame D-class mission. As I recall, those missions were quite a challenge for you, Kakashi teased. He cleared his throat. 
I intend for you to spend that time in Earth helping with their civil war and tracking down any leads on Sasuke, Kakashi answered. Really? Naruto asked, his voice bubbled with excitement. He pumped his fist into the air. Great. After his third bowl of ramen, Naruto excused himself to head towards the Hyuga compound. He and Hinata had a moderate-sized house amongst the Hyuga clan. Hinata would be overjoyed to learn that Naruto would soon be home permanently. She was currently three months pregnant a souvenir of their last visit home. Shall I walk home with you, Hag? Sai asked politely. Sakura kicked him in the shin. Sakura, he corrected. No, thanks, Sakura said with a smile. I think Ino would like to spend a little time with you. I'll see you later. If you're sure, Sai said with his eyebrows drawn together in concern. Sakura shared a two-bedroom apartment with Ino. However, since Ino and Sai started dating, it felt like she was intruding on their privacy. She spent most of her days on the road with Naruto and Sai. It seemed a little cruel that even when they were home, she still couldn't get any privacy from them. I'll see to it that she gets home safely, Kakashi promised. Sai nodded and then hurried out of the ramen shop. He worries about you, Kakashi said, once it was just him and Sakura at the table. We all do. I don't need you to worry about me. I can take care of myself, Sakura grumbled. She finished off the rest of the sake in her cup and used the carafe to pour more. And you learn from the best. Tsunade taught you more than just how to handle your drink, Kakashi agreed. Family worries about each other. We're family, Sakura. She sighed and set down her cup untouched. She looked across at Kakashi's dark, concerned gaze. It's just hard. Naruto and Sai are both moving on. When our mission as your special liaisons is over, they have someone to return to. Me? I'm just waiting. I don't even know why I'm waiting. He's not coming back. Kakashi sighed. Love is a funny thing, he said. Even if the one you love is gone, the loving them doesn't stop. Sakura stared down at her empty bowl of ramen. It was selfish to talk about loss to Kakashi. He'd lost everyone important to him his parents, teacher, and best friends. Kakashi reached out and grasped Sakura's shoulder and squeezed her gently. There's no need for such a guilty expression. I haven't lost everyone that I love. He smiled, his eyes crinkled at the corners. Now, let's stop feeling sorry for ourselves. You're not the one with your face carved into the side of a mountain. He cringed. For generations people will point and wonder about the fish lips I have hidden under my mask. Sakura burst out laughing, remembering a misadventure in her genin days with Sasuke and Naruto, as they tried to discover the face Kakashi hid under his mask. It's just, I thought that after the war, when Sasuke was back, that he would stay back. She picked up her cup of sake and sipped at it. I suggest you go easy on that, Kakashi said, gesturing towards the cup. You only have a day to rest. You'll be heading for Iwagakur the day after tomorrow. Sakura sat the cup back on the table, the alcohol sloshed over the sides. Walk me home. Of course, Kakashi agreed. After all, you are my favorite student. Kakashi escorted Sakura to her apartment. She hurried past Ino's bedroom and went straight to her own room at the end of the hall. She tried to ignore Ino's quiet giggles through the wall and Sai's deep chuckle. It was nice that her friends were happy, but it often made her own loneliness worse. Sakura opened her desk drawn and pulled out an old worn letter. It was from Sasuke. He'd sent to her six months after he had been away from Kanoha the second time. Sakura. Hi. I'm not very good with words. You know that. I don't want you to think the reason I left this time was because of you. It wasn't because of Naruto or Kakashi. Some bonds can never be severed, and I regret that I spent so much time trying to destroy ours. I hope you're doing well. You are so strong now and I am proud of who you have become. I've been heading west towards Iwagakur. The land here is pretty barren compared to home. I miss the green and I don't mean the trees. I will return. Please, be patient with me. Forever in your debt, Sasuke. Sakura carefully folded the letter and placed it back inside her desk. She turned off her lamp and crawled into her covers. And not for the first time, she soaked her pillow with tears before she finally drifted off into sleep. Lucy stared down at the brown leather book with a golden image of a large family tree embossed across the front cover. The librarian of the Magnolia Town Public Library had sent her a message that the book she'd requested had arrived. With an eager step, Lucy hurried towards an empty table in the far corner of the third floor, with the book clutched in her arms. She didn't know much about her mother's side of the family. Growing up, she'd always been raised to appreciate the Hertfilias and the power such a noble family possessed. However, her mother was the celestial spirit mage. She was the one whom Lucy favored in both looks, talent, and personality. Aquarius had served as the link between Lucy and her lost mother. The mermaid had been her mother's celestial spirit and Lucy's childhood friend. And now she was gone. Lucy felt the mermaid's absence keenly, especially since she still possessed Aquarius's powers over water. 
It had been a consolation gift from the Spirit King, but she'd have preferred her friend. She stared at the name on the front cover of the genealogy tree. Namikas. The book had details dating back five centuries. She found her own name as the last entry in the book, her mother's written right before. Layla Namikas heard Philia. There you are. Natsu's loud, exuberant voice echoed throughout the third floor of the library. The librarian and several patrons glared at him in unison with a mixture of shushes and annoyed sighs as responses. Of course, Natsu ignored them all and ran towards Lucy. Happy trailed after him with his white wings flapping lazily. Try to keep it down, Natsu. This is a library, Lucy pointed out patiently. She opened the book from the front to see what it said about her first known ancestor. They were from a distant region to the east of the Pergrin Kingdom. Happy landed on the table and peered down at the book, his blue cat face scrunched up in disinterest. This looks boring. You should read a story about fish. Did you know there are hundreds of different types in the ocean? And I'm sure there are hundreds more in the lakes and rivers. What are you doing? Natsu asked, sitting in the chair across from her and propping his feet on the table. His arms were folded behind his head and he stared up at the ceiling. No one is here. It's like everyone is out doing exciting missions and we're stuck here. He gestured towards the others in the library. With the civilians. I'm researching about my mother's side of the family, Lucy explained, keeping her voice at a whisper. The librarian walked over towards the table with another book in her arms. Here's the other book you requested Lucy. She smiled patiently at Natsu as she set the book next to Lucy. And if you could keep your voice down, Mr. Dragneel. She gave his elevated feet a pointed look. Yeah, sure, Natsu agreed, his feet sliding to the floor. He waited until the librarian walked away before he picked up the second book. Water magic. Why are you studying this? Can't you just ask Juvia for some tips? I don't want to bother her. She helped me some, but her magic is different than mine, Lucy answered. She'd rather give up the magic if it meant she could have Aquarius back. She'd ask Loke about making such an offer to the Spirit King, but he'd said it was impossible. The death of a celestial spirit was permanent. Now, Lucy was worried about calling forth any of her spirits. She didn't want to endanger anyone. I can light some fires and you can practice putting them out, Natsu offered. He began to flip through the pages of the water magic book. Tempting, Lucy murmured. She studied the first few generations of her ancestors. The common trait amongst them was bright blonde hair. Though, it seemed that the majority of her ancestors had blue eyes and not brown, but then she had her father's eyes. She continued to flip through the generations. About two centuries ago, her mother's side of the family had immigrated to Fiori. She looked up to see that Natsu was reading her genealogy book upside down. My mother's family was from the fire country in the far east, he said quietly. Lucy stared at him in stunned silence. He never talked about his human parents. She didn't think he even remembered them after having been raised predominantly by Igniel. She used to tell me stories about the Hidden Leaf Village, where certain people had the ability to create fire and lightning by organizing their hands in certain patterns. Natsu looked up, his dark eyes serious. How's your rent? I'm covered for at least six months, Lucy answered. Our last job with Gray and Urza was really profitable, especially so, since we were able to keep the majority of the money. You and Gray should try more often not to inflict too much collateral damage. That's why I'm here in the library, instead of stressing out at the job request board in the guild hall. Natsu grinned. Give me and Happy a couple of hours. We're going to ask Master Makarov if he knows of any jobs that might send us to Pergrin Kingdom. Then afterwards, we could continue east. Maybe we can track down our relatives. The idea was exciting. If they could find a mission in Pergrin Kingdom, their passage there would be paid for by the job. That would put them very close to the Far East countries of their ancestors. Do you know what your mother's maiden name was? Lucy asked. Natsu scratched the back of his head, tussling his unruly pink hair, and closed his eyes in concentration, his brow furrowed. Haruno, I think. She had a brother, Uncle Kizashi, but I never met him. He shrugged. She used to tell me stories when I was very young before I went to bed. I don't remember much though. Lucy was impressed that he remembered that much. While you speak with Master Makarov, I'll ask the librarian if there are any books about the fire country in the east. The land was dry and arid. Mountains stretched high into the sky, trapping the hot air and not allowing cooler air to circulate. Itachi's crows were dispersed and he could see the activity of the region. Death was everywhere. What has become of this country? Itachi asked. Surely, not much time has passed since the alliance amongst the shinobi nations. Only a few years, the old necromancer said. He coughed, an unhealthy rattle deep in his lungs. He would not live long with his current health. Civil war has broken out amongst the citizens of Earth. The Tsuchikage died and while he recommended his granddaughter for the role, many don't feel she's old enough or has enough experience. And that's not even taking into account the fact that she's a woman. Itachi frowned. 
The leader of Kanoha is a strong woman. The Mizukage is also a woman. The necromancer looked at Itachi incredulously. Are you talking about Princess Tsunade? She retired as soon as the war was over. She spends most of her time drinking herself into oblivion. I would think she might dedicate herself to the hospital, Itachi said quietly. He didn't know Tsunade well, but he had respected her skills. He suspected that if she hadn't left the village after the third war, she might have been around to offer him a treatment for his lung condition. She might have been a drunk, but she was a brilliant healer. And besides, it wasn't like she slaughtered her entire clan what did she have to be so depressed about. Still this is the best place for old bones like mine. Why is that? The dry, arid air of the mountains is the only thing prolonging this miserable life of mine, the necromancer said with a smile that turned more into a grimace. There is dark magic brewing in this region, taking advantage of the bloodshed of the civil war. Is that what you were doing? Trying to take advantage of the spoils of war? Itachi asked. Who are you? The necromancer shook his head. No, I'm trying to stop her. He closed his eyes and took a deep breath. I was once known as Eden. I have been in this land for the past three years trying to learn what I could of this place. I have to stop her. Stop who? She's been feeding off this land since the third great ninja war, the necromancer continued. A shudder passed through his frail body. As she once fed upon my country, she does so again here. The dark goddess especially craves the blood of shinobi from the hidden leaf, always has since she first sampled it years ago, he said. Itachi stiffened. He remembered the excessive violence he often faced as a member of Anbu whenever he squared off against Rock Ninja. She's chosen a new vessel a youth with so much pain and darkness that she's stronger than ever. Itachi felt his stomach twist. Does this vessel have a name? They call him Hawk. Why are you in particular trying to stop this dark goddess? Itachi asked. Why do you think you can make a difference? The old man rubbed his hand over his lips worriedly. Because, I was her vessel before centuries ago in a land to the far west of here. No one knows her better than I. He clutched onto Itachi's robbed arm. Please, Reaper, you must stop her. Itachi opened his mind to the images his scouting crows projected towards him. Eden was right. This land was saturated in blood and death. He wasn't certain how long he could remain on earth of his own volition, now that his spirit was linked to a magical key. He wouldn't do Rand do whatever he could. Whether or not he met the golden-haired mage Loke spoke of, he cared not. Itachi was a shinobi and had a mission. He ordered his crows to continue into the distance with a mission to find the man known as Hawk. Do you suppose we might stop soon? Sai asked. Sakura scanned the horizon. They still had a good hour of sunlight left before they needed to make camp. She looked over her two teammates. Both men looked like they were dead on their feet. She smirked. Well, perhaps if you two hadn't been quite so enthusiastic in your reunions with your significant others, you wouldn't be so tired. Oh, come on, Sakura-chan. Naruto whined. That is not fair. Do you know how much grief I got from Hiashi from getting Hinata pregnant and then having the gall to be off on special missions for the Hokage? Bolt is due in three months, and I was threatened very thoroughly by my sister-in-law that if I'm not there in time for the birth well I don't even want to repeat it. I'm pretty sure both Hiashi and Hanabi are going to give you flack regardless, Sakura said, feeling no sympathy for her best friend. I will do my best to make sure we're home in time for the birth. She pointed an accusing finger at Sai. And you should have gone to bed at a decent time. I heard you and Eno until four in the morning. Sai's pale cheeks reddened and he rubbed the back of his neck. We did attempt to be quiet. Sakura touched her hand over her chest. We're all ninja. I heard everything. I eventually had to go and sleep on the roof because you two were too loud. She shoved Sai on the shoulder. Do you know how uncomfortable it is to sleep on the roof? About as uncomfortable as sleeping in the woods. Naruto guessed. He grinned, causing his eyes to crinkle at the corners visibly behind his mask, the fatigue from earlier gone. I'm good going farther, Sakura-chan. She sighed. No, you're right. We'll stop here and set up camp. She rubbed the back of her neck and tried to loosen the tension that had bundled up there over the past few hours. She hadn't slept well, and it wasn't because of Eno and Sai in the next room over. She sat on a nearby log and stretched out her legs. Did you have another one of those dreams? Naruto asked quietly. He sat beside her. About Sasuke. Sai began to set up a fire. They'd cook their meal during daylight so as not to attract attention. They were still within the fire country, so they weren't in any particular danger as of yet. I read the letter again. I guess it just stirred up my imagination, Sakura said. She shoved up her Anbu mask and rubbed her face. It just seemed so real. Maybe it was real, Naruto said. He nudged her with his elbow gently in the ribs. When you have a strong connection with someone, maybe it allows you to know things. Sakura turned towards him. Have you dreamed about him too? Naruto shrugged. Maybe. Same as you, sometimes I see things. 
I see Sasuke, but he's different. He wears a mask of onyx over his face, but I would recognize that wild Tichiha hair anywhere. There's no taming it, Sakura agreed. I wonder if that's why Itachi wore his in a ponytail, she mused. Maybe, Naruto said. I see so much blood in the dreams. I hope it's not real. He rubbed his prosthetic arm absently. But I try to see past the mask and past the blood. I try to focus on his left hand. And I'm almost certain it's like mine. I think it's the prosthetic. He turned to Sakura, his blue eyes bright. I think it's him. Sakura nodded. I can't look beyond the mask. I see his eyes, swirling pools of crimson and black sharingan on the right and lavender rinnegan on the left. She shivered, Gusiflish covered her arms under her armor. But, I sense there is someone else. Something else. I think he's a prisoner. She hoped he was a prisoner, because that would mean that he didn't willfully leave her behind for so long. The woman, Naruto said, nodding. I've seen her too. I cannot see her face because she's enshrouded in a cape of black raven feathers. He sighed. There's not been much word about his other teammates either Sajetsu, Karen, Jugo. I wonder if they are somehow involved. We'll find out soon enough, Sai said. He crouched in front of them and held out two sticks of meat and vegetables speared through shish kebab style. Eat up and then put your mask back on, he said, pointedly looking at Sakura. You'll be sure to get plenty of rest tonight, Sai, Sakura said, brushing her fingers across her mask. I'd rather use your ink birds to travel instead of going on foot. It's faster by far. Sai nodded. He'd been disappointed that his ink birds hadn't been nearly as strong in their quality. He'd made some that morning, but they'd only lasted two hours before his chakra reserves were too low to maintain them. He'd been embarrassed that his night with Eno had affected his stamina for the field. Naruto had laughed uncontrollably for a while after the explanation of why his ink birds weren't as strong as usual. There was so much blood and death. The smell of decay was nauseatingly strong, though Sasuke didn't react. He didn't react to much aside from rage. The slaughter of his clan had made him numb to most things. Which was good, because she didn't care for human reactions. When he pleaded to be released so he could return to his friends his family, she'd laughed. He only intended to be gone from the leaf for a few months. He'd been looking forward to being lectured by Kakashi, sparring with Naruto, and sharing a future with Sakura. Hell, he was even looking forward to becoming real friends with Sai. He respected the former Root member's loyalty to Naruto and Sakura. He had failed them both repeatedly, but Sai had treasured their friendship. Sasuke was envious of the man. The mysterious woman offered to return him to his family. With a wave of her hand, he could see the corpses of his mother and father. Their gray skin was loose on their bones, and their hair had mostly fallen out, but he was almost certain this was their actual bodies, and she'd brought them before him with some dark form of magic. With a disgusted wave of her hand, they vanished in a thick dark mist. He always wondered, why hadn't she showed him Itachi's body? His brother meant more to him than his parents. Did she not have access to his body? Was it because after he defeated Kabuto, he'd sealed his body so that no one else could control it? Itachi was always three steps ahead of everyone. Had he already outwitted this woman? Did he somehow know about her? She sniffed the air disdainfully. I do not care for this desolate land. My kingdom is rich with green and you can smell the ocean. Feel free to go back there, Sasuke murmured. She gripped him by the throat and held him in the air, his feet dangled above the ground. Her black feathered cape billowed in the gust of wind she called towards them. He could see a glimpse of her weathered face ancient beyond anything mortal. She smiled, the smell of rot drifted from her mouth. Oh no, civilization and peace has made that land into a famine for my needs. She threw him away and Sasuke landed hard on his back and gasped for air. This land, she said holding her hands up and spinning in a slow circle. This land is ripe. I have been here for twenty years feeding, slowly upon the fat of this shinobi world. I've gorged myself and my power is stronger than ever. She walked towards him, the feathers of her cape glittering in blackness about her. Now you try to have peace. I think not. You, I can sense a darkness inside of you. She crouched next to him. Death hangs about you like a second skin. You will be my vessel. If it's all the same to you, I'd rather return home, Sasuke said. He tried to summon his Susanoo, but something about this woman prevented him from accessing his chakra. She smiled, a malicious glint in her black eyes. Very well. Then I shall feast upon your friends first. She cocked her head to the side. Sakura is it? I'm sure she will make a nice appetizer. I shall rip her heart out before your eyes. Make her watch in those few moments of consciousness as I eat her flesh while you do nothing. Her smile grew. And then Naruto, yes. I will rip out his intestines and slowly make a dress of his entrails while he watches helpless. That fox inside him will serve as a rich spice to my meal. Leave them alone, Sasuke growled. She shrugged. If you will agree to be my vessel, I see no reason to harm these friends of yours. 
She pushed back the hood of her robes, and the horrible vision of her face was replaced by youthful, smooth flesh. Come, my hawk. We have work to do. Someone gently shook Lucy's bare shoulder. Without opening her eyes, she batted them away and turned onto her side away from the person. Leave me alone, I'm sleeping, she mumbled. Wake up, Natsu said. He gripped both Lucy's shoulders and yanked her flat on her back. Lucy opened her eyes and sat up immediately, knocking her forehead against Natsu's. Hey. Watch it. Natsu backed up and rubbed his forehead with a cringe. What's your deal? You were hovering over me in my sleep. Lucy cried out. Yeah, well, I found us a job in Pergrind. Our train leaves at noon. He stepped away from her bed and plopped down on the couch in the living room, his feet propped up on the coffee table. She saw that his travel bag was next to her front door, and Happy was sleeping curled up on top of it. What time is it? Lucy asked. She glanced around at her clock. It was 10 o'clock. I'm surprised you're still sleeping, Natsu said, closing his eyes and leaning his head back against the couch pillows. Normally, you're the first one up when we go on missions. Lucy didn't point out that the reason she was normally the first one up was so that Cancer would have a chance to fix her hair. I was up late reading, she explained. I only went to bed around 4. Okay, Natsu said. So, are you going to tell me what the job is? Lucy asked. She got out of bed and started to make it up. If they were going to be gone for an extended period, she at least wanted the apartment to be neat in her absence. Well it's the biggest kingdom in the known world, Natsu said. So as you can imagine, they don't request outside help much. Though there is an eccentric rider that lives out there. He sent out a request to Fairy Tail after we won the Grand Magic Games for some mages to interview. Makarov had been keeping the request private. Why would he do that? Lucy asked. Because Pergrind is a long way away and any requests from that great a distance shouldn't be trusted. Natsu let his feet fall from the coffee table onto the floor and then jumped over the back of the couch to head for the kitchen. He opened Lucy's refrigerator and started to help himself to the various leftovers. Might as well eat this now. It will all be bad by the time we return. So this rider is disreputable? Lucy asked. She wrinkled her nose in disgust as Natsu wolfed down half the roasted chicken she had left over from two nights ago. If he's dangerous, maybe we shouldn't go. That's why Master Makarov kept the request secret. There's only a handful of S-class mages that would be eligible for this trip, Natsu said. He licked the grease off his fingers from the chicken you and I were his top choices. But, I'm not an S-class mage, Lucy argued. She walked into her kitchen and turned on the stove for her teapot. She took out a mug and set a tea bag of orange and mint inside. Natsu rolled his eyes. Seriously, Luce. You're using the stove when I'm right here. He picked up the teapot with his bare hands and heated it up before he poured the hot water into her mug. It doesn't matter that you're not S-class right now. You will be within the next year or two, I'm sure. You've progressed a lot in the two years that you've been here. He grinned. You're a great partner. Lucy smiled and leaned her hip against the counter. It felt good to have Natsu praise her as a partner, especially when she so often felt useless in battle without her keys or her whip. Now with Aquarius's powers, she had the element of water in her arsenal. There was a knock at the front door, and Happy continued to sleep undisturbed. I'll get it, Natsu said. Lucy watched him make his way towards the door. Her partner was oftentimes clueless about social protocols, but he was fierce in battle, and he had a nice backside that she appreciated. She used a spoon to fish out the tea packets and dump them in her wastebasket before sipping from her tea. She closed her eyes in bliss at the tangy flavor. Natsu? What are you doing here? Gray asked. Lucy looked up in surprise to see Gray standing at her threshold. Never mind what I'm doing here. What do you want? Natsu asked, his voice unfriendly. He's off, Gray warned, his navy eyes narrowed. I came to see if Lucy wanted to practice some more with her water magic. Natsu backed away from the door and made room for Gray to enter. He shut the door behind him. Happy opened one of his eyes, and upon seeing the tension between Natsu and Gray, promptly closed it and feigned sleep. Sorry Gray. But, we'll be leaving on a mission in a few hours, Lucy explained. Though, Gray said, visibly disappointed. He shoved his hands into his front pockets and slouched against the wall. When will you be back? Maybe we can work on it then. Lucy turned towards Natsu. I don't know. How long do you think? A month or two, maybe longer, Natsu answered. He went back to the kitchen and started working on the cold chicken again. Lucy imagined that with every bite he took, he reheated the chicken with his mouth. I'm not sure that's a good idea with a new power, Lucy, Gray said, a worried expression on his face. I don't think I can handle any more lessons with Juvia, Gray. Sorry, Lucy said. She drained the remainder of her tea, washed a mug in the sink, and then set it to dry upside down on a towel on the counter. Bray grimaced and scratched the back of his neck awkwardly. Yeah, sorry about that. 
I got carried away with Loke and sort of left you alone to her devices. You know she considers me a rival for your affections. She might be a talented water mage, but she's not a very understanding teacher, Lucy said. Look, you two behave. I'm going to take a shower and then I'm going to pack. I want to come, Gray said. You what? Natsu growled. On your mission. We work well together, Gray said gesturing between the three of them. And I would love to escape from Juvia during that time. I should be able to help you with mastering your water element. It has many of the same principles as ice. Lucy smiled. She glanced at Natsu and caught the frown on his face before it disappeared a moment later. It's okay with me, Lucy said. Natsu, you want to tell him why we're really headed east and see if he still wants to come along. Yeah, sure, Natsu said. Go ahead and take your shower, Luce. He grinned at her. I'll finish cleaning out your refrigerator for you. The border to Awagakur loomed before them. Sasuke had sent Sakura exactly three letters during his absence. The last of the three was the one that she read over and over. But, the second letter had been his impressions about the regions he'd traveled through thinking that his observations might one day be of use. Sasuke wasn't the most poetic of men, but his descriptions were spot on. The earth country was dry, arid, and unfriendly. Over the past few years, Sakura had developed earth and water release. Naruto had an affinity for all the nature types just like Kakashi and Sasuke Sai also possessed fire, earth, and water. Their mutual ability to manipulate earth made their likelihood of entering a Wagaker possible. They wouldn't be able to pass through the hostile borders, but they could pass underneath them. Naruto manipulated the lava flowing beneath the ground, while Sakura and Sai merged their chakra with his to keep a protective bubble of water around them. The world underneath was fascinating, everything had an orange glow, a reflection of both the magma and Naruto's sage chakra. It was warm, but not uncomfortable. A constant layer of steam circled around them, making the view opaque, but the subterranean levels glittered with gemstones, copper, and silver. I wonder if Earth has any idea of what treasure lies beneath the surface. Sai mused. If they did, I doubt if we'd be seeing so much of it, Sakura answered in a strained voice. It would have been mined years ago. While she had improved with water release, it was still difficult for her maintain for extended periods. Well, when Sasuke gets back he better pick a couple of diamonds from here and offer you a really nice present, Naruto said with a smirk, casting a quick glance over his shoulder at Sakura. Eyes ahead, Naruto, Sakura said. She appreciated Naruto's never-ending faith that Sasuke would return to them again, but the longer he was away the less likely that seemed. When they were kids, they failed to bring him back home. This time, if they couldn't convince him, they would both have to move on with their lives without him. I don't get why Kakashi keeps putting you in charge, Naruto grumbled. You're always nagging me. He mimicked Sakura by standing with his legs braced apart and holding one fist in his open palm. It's time to make camp. You can't have Raymond for dinner. Don't leave the fire unattended. Oranges in camouflage. He dropped the stance blew out a trusted breath. Shesh. I assure you, it's only because I care, Sakura said with an absent grin. She does tend to remain more focused, Sai pointed out. That's because you're always thinking about your next painting, and Naruto is thinking about how soon he can return home to Hinata, Sakura said. Naruto led them through a volcano and spit them out onto the ground. It was late evening. Their protective water bubble dissolved and they crouched on the ground orienting themselves. You make it sound like I don't enjoy my missions with you too, Naruto whispered. The sky had an ominous green cast to it and storm clouds had abruptly gathered. From their research about the weather patterns of the land, it was a clear sign of a hail storm. And the hail from Awagakur was known to be the size of fists and quite deadly. Dome? Sakura asked. Dome, Naruto and Sai agreed. Together, the three of them laid their hands on the earth and created a small domed shelter, big enough for the three of them to lay stretched out side by side. Naruto laid flat on his back and stared at the roof of their protective shelter. I am starved. Sakura reached into her backpack and pulled out a couple of protein bars. She tossed one at Naruto, and he caught it with ease. Shizun and I engineered these bars, she explained, handing the second bar to Sai. She reached into her pack for a third one for herself. Each protein bar contains 1500 calories and will substantially boost your chakra. Naruto ripped off the paper cover and bit into the protein bar. Doesn't taste too bad. For a moment, I worried it would have been another one of your kale mental alertness bars. Sakura frowned. She and Ino had created the kale mental alertness bars the year before. They'd won several accolades at the Kanoha Medical Society convention. Studies show that those bars improved mental agility by threefold. They tasted like grass, Sai said blandly. Sakura glared at him and he smiled. Very smart grass, he added. Our mission is to track down Inoki Kamizuru's granddaughter, Kuritsuchi. He named her as the Yandame Tsuchikage before he died, Naruto said. I don't remember much about her. You? 
He asked angling his neck to see Sakura and Sai. Tall, dark hair, dark eyes. She should be about 21 now, Sakura said. How do you remember all that? Naruto asked. Her Kikei Genkai is Lava Elise, and her father is a big burly man by the name of Katsuchi, Sai said. We read the mission report. I read the mission report, Naruto protested with a scowl. Sakura raised an eyebrow and he flushed. Okay, fine, I skimmed it. But it was really long. Which is why you're not in charge of the missions, Sai said. Akatsuchi should also be with Kuritsuchi. He was Inoki's bodyguard and fiercely loyal. If the third Tsuchikage named Kuritsuchi as his heir, Akatsuchi would do all in his power to make sure the line of succession proceeded, Sakura said. I remember him. He's got a big flat nose, Naruto said with a chuckle. And he's a freaking giant. Even taller than Pervy Sage was. Are you sure about that? You were shorter when you were training with Jureya, Sakura said. Naruto grinned. And now I'm 180 centimeters tall. And Kakashi is 181 centimeters tall, Sakura reminded him. Now, shut up and get some sleep. As soon as the hailstorm subsides we need to start tracking down Kuritsuchi. Sasuke clenched his fists, both his natural one and the prosthetic. It was often a challenge to hide his distaste for Kasai Arashi. If it had been his decision, he'd have taken Ichidori to the sycophant's hearts ages ago. The man was nothing more than a warmonger. He had no higher goal than to rule as leader of Iwagakur. The problem with that, Iwagakur already had an appointed leader, and it wasn't him. Morrigan had an affinity for Arashi, so killing the fool wasn't an option. The goddess could alter her appearance, but Sasuke saw past her facade. Sasuke saw Morrigan as a cruel and wretched crone. Arashi saw an alluring, beautiful woman. Morrigan had been upset when she first learned that Sasuke saw past her illusions of beauty. Between his Sharingan and his Rinnegan, no Jinjutsu could fool him. Lord Arashi, there's been a disturbance at the border, one of the Earth Shinobi reported. Which border? The border near fire. Through the rain territory there was a huge surge of chakra that seemed to pass through the ground. It set off some of our alarms, but it moved too fast for us to trace, the ninja answered. Arashi's dark eyes narrowed. Impossible. Sasuke's interest was piqued. Huge amounts of chakra, too fast for normal detection, and from the direction of Konoha. He knew exactly who that was. Naruto had never given up on him before, and he wasn't about to give up on him now. He wouldn't be alone. No doubt, Sakura was with him and probably Sai. He didn't know Sai well, but from the little interaction he had with the man before he left the village again, he knew that Sai worked well with Naruto and Sakura. He worked better with them than Sasuke ever had. That knowledge made Sasuke his gaze drifted over towards Morrigan. If he had been a team player, he never would have crossed paths with that one. Not for the first time, Sasuke regretted his decision to leave the village after the war. He claimed to miss his clan, but when he had the chance to rebuild bonds of family and friendship, he turned his back on the opportunity. He had come to love his solitude, and now countless lives would be lost due to his selfishness. His fists tightened, and his nails pierced his right palm enough to draw blood. Ock Morgan called, raising her hand towards him. I am in need of your services. Sasuke sauntered over towards the goddess of death. He would continue to do her bidding. There was little choice in the matter, especially with Sakura and Naruto so close by. He hoped that Sakura received his letters and would realize that he had been kept away involuntarily. If anyone would find a way to defeat impossible odds, it was Naruto and Sakura. Lucy followed after Natsu and Happy to board the train. She carried a light purse with the train tickets, her journal, and a wallet full of jewels over her shoulder. Natsu carried her heavier travel bag as well as his own. Bray walked alongside her and kept looking anxiously over his shoulder. What are you looking for? she asked. I've been trying to lose Juvia all day, Gray explained, tugging on his shirt collar. Every drop of water I see, I'm afraid it's her. Natsu smirked. Maybe you should let her catch you. Gray frowned. No way. I want to come. It's been too long since our team had a mission. Me, Happy, and Lucy are a team, Natsu said with a frown of his own. Gray arched his dark eyebrows. Shall you be the one to tell Urza that she's not on their team? I see your point, Natsu said, clearing his throat. He shifted Lucy's bag over his shoulder and glanced behind to meet Lucy's gaze. This thing is heavy. What all did you pack? It's just one bag. Lucy protested. It wasn't like she traveled with mountains of luggage like Urza. She had invested in a compartment magic bag that could hold ten times as many objects as there appeared to be space. It wasn't that heavy though. It's probably full of makeup, so she can try to look pretty and date a bunch of strange men that she meets on the mission, happy guest. Lucy's mouth gaped at the suggestion. She hardly ever dated. She'd maybe gone on three dates since she joined the guild. That is simply not true. Who wants to go on a date with Lucy? Natsu asked with a wrinkled nose of confusion. Excuse me? Lucy hissed. 
She could feel her cheeks burning in embarrassment. Lucy is a smart, attractive woman, Gray answered. I'm sure tons of guys would want to go on a date with her. He smiled at Lucy and dropped his hand away from his shirt collar. Probably a few girls too. Lucy grinned back. Thanks, Gray. Whatever, Natsu scoffed. They boarded the train without much delay. Lucy purchased a cup of ginger tea from the refreshment cart in anticipation of Natsu's motion sickness. She sat next to Gray and gave Natsu the seat across from them so he could stretch out for comfort. As soon as the train left the station, Natsu became immediately nauseated. Lucy grimaced and offered the ginger tea. Unfortunately, the tea seemed to have little effect. What is it about dragon slayers and motion sickness? Gray asked in disgust as he crumpled the empty teacup. It doesn't seem to affect Wendy, Happy said. He balanced precariously on the luggage rack above their heads. It's just the guys. The door to their private train car was shoved open, and a harried Urza stood in the doorway. How dare you leave on a job without me? Gray's face paled in terror, and Natsu hid his face in his arms and moaned his discomfort louder. Lucy smiled broadly, knowing that of the three she was the only one brave enough to explain their departure to Titania. It's not really a job, as much as an excuse to travel east. Natsu and I are hoping to visit some distant relatives. Color returned to Gray's face, and he looked quickly between Lucy and Natsu. You two are related. Lucy laughed nervously. Ugh, no. It would make her attraction to her partner way beyond creepy if it turned out they were related. Oh. Well, then it's a good thing I got back just an hour ago. Marahan told me about the job request and sent me to find you all here. Urza shoved Natsu against the window and sat next to him. What are the details? Natsu rubbed the back of his neck and looked across the aisle at Lucy. He smiled faintly at her. I think that ginger tea may have kicked in a little. Thanks, Luisi, he drawled. Lucy let out a relieved sigh that the herbal remedy helped. You're welcome. Natsu stood and dug into his bag on the luggage rack. Here you go, Happy said, reaching into the bag himself and pulling out the job request paper. Natsu handed the paper to Urza. She scanned over the request briefly and then read it again slower. Nikolai Berezin wants to interview mages from the champion of the Grand Magic Games for an article, Urza said, arching a scarlet eyebrow. She rolled the scroll up and handed it back to Happy. It's a ploy, she stated. Of course it is, Natsu agreed. Transportation between Fiori and Pergrind is expensive. I don't care if this Nikolai wants something more than an interview. Lucy and I just needed an excuse to travel east. For your family, Urza clarified. Yeah, Lucy agreed. Don't you wonder about your family? No, Urza said with a shrug. I spent my childhood as a slave. Jell is the only family I had before I joined Fairy Tale. She shifted her eyes towards Grey. What about you? He's avoiding Juvia, Happy answered in a sing-song voice. The tips of Grey's ears turned red. He slouched in his seat, folded his arms over his chest, and ignored everyone while trying to fall asleep. Lucy stared out the window at the passing scenery. I've never been outside of Fiori. Me neither, Natsu said. He covered his mouth abruptly. I think the ginger tea wore off. I have the cure for that, Urzo offered. She knocked him unconscious with a swift strike of her hand against the back of his head before he could protest. Natsu slumped limply against the window. She focused her attention on Lucy. How has your training been going with the water magic? It's been a challenge, Lucy confessed with a sigh. She hated dishonoring Aquarius's memory with her mediocre skill with the element. Bray sat up abruptly, no longer feigning sleep. I'll be continuing my training with her during the trip. Urza nodded. Good. I'll supervise. I have a couple of equips that are useful with water. How would your equips be useful with water? Happy asked. Do you turn into a giant fish? Because that would be a useful talent. No, I do not have any giant fish equips, Urza said. She cast her eyes over Lucy in a quick inspection. You look terrible, Lucy. Why don't you get some sleep? Gray and I will stay on guard. Lucy grit her teeth at the observation, but she couldn't argue. With only a couple of hours of sleep the night before she was exhausted. Here, I'll trade places. You and Natsu can sleep, Urza offered. Lucy exchanged seats with Urza and sat next to Natsu. She curled her legs up under her and leaned against Natsu's warm shoulder. He cracked open eye, not unconscious after all. He held out his arm and Lucy snuggled against his chest. They fell asleep with Urza and Gray's quiet conversation across from them. I do not understand why you won't agree to a contract with me, Reaper, Eden complained. He held the onyx key in his hand and brought it close to his eyes. What is so special about this key that allows you to choose your contractor? I will work with you, but I will not be obligated to you, Eden, Itachi said. He intended to hold out on signing any contracts until he met Leo's master Lucy. He spent too much of his life working for corrupt people. He didn't want to spend his afterlife doing the same. I'm an honorable man, Eden said. You can trust me. 
One should never trust a man who peers death in the eye and finds way to postpone the inevitable, Itachi answered. He didn't add that necromancers were rather despicable people in his opinion. He was particularly sensitive about the subject after Kabuto had resurrected his body and tried to use him to kill those he swore to protect. Ahead of them stood the charred remains of a village. The cinders still burned and the cries of the dying echoed across the land. Itachi felt his power rising as the need to release those souls from their mortal pains grew. Ah, perfect timing, Eden said. I need to collect more materials, he rasped. The fresh corpses are easier than the long dead ones. Those tend to be feral and difficult to manage. Itachi wouldn't allow Eden to plunder the dying. He would ease their suffering and send them off. He paused before starting his task as three strong chakras approached. He recognized one as Naruto Uzumaki. By the harmonic resonance of the three chakras working in tandem, he reasoned that the other two were that of Sakura Haruno and Sasuke's replacement, Sai. Someone comes, Itachi said. He used mist to hide his features and obscure himself further within his dark cloak. He brought shadows over himself and Eden to watch the scene unfold. So, then kill them and make me more materials, Eden whispered. Why should we hide? They are of no consequence. The important thing is to reach the goddess. Itachi strived not to have strong opinions about people. However, he was growing to dislike the necromancer a great deal. He watched as the three mask anbu spread across the village's ruins. He had two crow familiars in the area and sent them to watch the two males while he watched a female himself. Surely, hair that pink could only belong to a woman. Next to him, Eden cursed while Sakura went about the casualties and healed those that were still alive. Under her mystical palm technique, even the ones near death stabilized. You must stop that one, Eden hissed. She's ruining it. He started toward Sakura, but Itachi moved to block the way. Naruto flashed to his side. What are you doing here? Naruto asked. I do not answer to masked men, Eden growled. Naruto directed his attention towards Itachi, though the cloak and shadows made him impossible to recognize. His blue eyes narrowed. You seem familiar, he said. Leave my servant alone, Eden said. Itachi turned towards the necromancer. Servant. Eden held up the onyx key. You see this? This means the reaper belongs to me. He started to laugh hysterically, but the laughter soon turned into a coughing fit bloody spittle formed on his chin. Is that right? Naruto flashed forward and stole the key from Eden's grasp. He reappeared at Sakura's side and handed it to her. Itachi saw her place it in her pocket before Naruto reappeared in front of the necromancer, before the old man realized what happened. It is wrong to imprison a great power to force it to do your bidding. What happened? Eden panicked. My key. Sakura finished stabilizing her injured patient and then hurried to Naruto's side. She stared at the necromancer with wide eyes. How are you alive? She whispered. By stealing life of those around him, Itachi answered. He stood resolutely as a barrier between her and Eden. He couldn't risk the necromancer regaining the key, or else he wouldn't be able to do what he now realized he needed to do. Eden looked up squinting into Itachi's eyes. You must destroy them, Reaper. They will only be in our way. She must be stopped. She's ruining everything. I have heard your story, Eden. I understand your concern. I will take this burden of yours and destroy the Death Goddess. You must find your peace, Itachi said. He laid his palm over Eden's face, and the man fell dead, his body crumpled to the ground. The magic that had been animating him dissipated and he dissolved into bone and dust, the weight of the centuries accumulating at once. So I joined them and tooed the remains with his boot. Itachi turned to face Sakura again. You hold my key, Sakura Haruno. What will you have me do? Sakura blinked her jade eyes at him, the only visible indicator of her expression from behind the mask. You know my name. I do, Itachi said. Fate must have smiled down upon him to allow him to cross paths with loyal shinobi of Konoha, his brother's truest friends at that. And I give it back to you? Sakura asked. Itachi shook his head. I cannot hold my own key. Like a free genie, Sai said. Too much power without a master. Naruto groaned. Were you watching Aladdin again? Something like that, Itachi agreed before Sai could answer. Sakura glanced at Naruto and he shrugged. He seems like a good ally to have in this place, he said. Sakura turned back to Itachi in his cloaked guise. How about I keep it safe until you can find an appropriate candidate for ownership? Itachi bowed his head. That is acceptable. Any idea what happened here? Sakura asked. Itachi looked around the raised village. Needless destruction and death. It is a civil war after all. War is stupid, Naruto complained. Yes it is, Itachi agreed. You seem really familiar, Sakura said, turning to him with suspicion in her eyes. I assure you, you do not know me, Itachi said. Your voice you remind me of someone, she insisted. We still have a few hours of daylight. Shall we continue? Sai asked. 
There are no more lives for you to save here, healer, Itachi said. She turned towards him again. How do you know that? I haven't checked yet. He held out his hands. My gifts include the ability to sense death and to distinguish life. Of the latter, there is none aside from the three of you and the four you already saved. I took the liberty of putting them to sleep while we had our little moment here. You're not alive? Sakura asked. Itachi shook his head. Not anymore. We still need to track down our target, Sakura said. Perhaps I can be of assistance, Itachi said. He held up his hands and two crows came and landed upon his shoulders. With my crows I can track virtually anyone. Can you track down Sasuke Chia? Naruto asked immediately. Sakura elbowed him hard in the ribs. Our mission comes first, no matter how much we might want to find him, she whispered. We're tracking down the rightful Tsuchikage. She's gone into hiding due to the excessive rebel forces. Itachi nodded and sent his crows off to begin the search, they would contact their brothers and sisters to pass on the quest. We should keep looking for other villages, such as this one, and try to help the survivors, Sakura ordered. She turned back towards Itachi. They're only asleep, you say. Your wish is my command, Itachi said, smirking within the privacy of his hood. And yes, they are only sleeping. They should awaken in the next half hour. It would be a good idea to leave during that time. She nodded. Okay. Sakura wasn't a blonde mage, but she would make an excellent guardian for his key in the interim. And amongst these three, surely he would cross paths with Sasuke. It might be nice to travel with fellow Kanoha shinobi that were uncorrupted by Danzo's reign of terror. The train's dinner car was mostly empty when Lucy wandered over there during the middle of the night. Her teammates seemed to have no trouble with sleep, and she didn't want to disturb them. She struggled trying to sleep, the memory of Aquarius's loss replayed over and over in her dreams. She brought along her journal and a pen to work on her novel, might as well make use of her time. Her hand flew across the page, recounting the heart-wrenching loss of Aquarius. She wrote about her anticipation on meeting the lost relatives in her mother's side the Namikazes. What if they were all gone? Would this adventure be for naught? Lucy hardly noticed when the waiter returned and dropped off the seaweed salad and fresh miniature oranges she'd ordered. She set aside her pen and dug a fork into the salad absently, knowing she should eat, but her depression stole away her hunger. You're up late, Loke said, materializing in the seat across from her. He snatched up one of the oranges and started to peel off the rind. Something troubling you? Just thinking about Aquarius, Lucy said. She took her straw and swirled it around in her raspberry tea. And the relatives on my mom's side that I'm hoping to find. Maybe they don't want to be found. What if there was a big dramatic break in the family and my mother's relatives were forced to head west? Uh huh. Loke popped a section of orange into his mouth. You're thinking too much. So how is the mastering of Aquarius's powers coming along? I get wet. Loke grinned and waggled his fiery eyebrows. I bet you do. Lucy took her straw and thumped it towards him, splashing his nose with tea. I have some interesting news, Loke said, leaning towards her with his elbows on the table. He yanked a napkin toward his face to wipe his nose dry. There is a new celestial spirit. Lucy frowned. Is that unusual? I haven't seen a new one born in centuries, Loke confessed. And this spirit, he's as strong as a zodiac. A new Aquarius. Loke shook his head and picked up her tea and drank half of it. This is pretty good and no. Aquarius lives in you now. What's his gate? This new celestial spirit. Bait of the crow and his name is Reaper, Loke explained. Instead of a golden or silver key, his key is Onyx. Onyx. Lucy snatched her glass out of Loke's hand. Mooch. You're worse than Taurus, she complained. I've never heard of a key other than silver or gold. Me neither. Loke's dark eyes flashed with excitement behind his glasses. He's pretty interesting too very stoic. Handsome too, if you like that sort of thing. Who doesn't like that sort of thing? Lucy asked. She waved the waiter over and ordered another glass of tea. She set the half-empty glass in front of Loke. This one is yours. The only problem is he's been missing for a few weeks now. He's a new spirit, so he shouldn't have the spiritual power to survive outside of the spirit world for this long. Loke tapped his fingers on the table. I'm actually pretty worried. It takes a lot to worry you, Lucy murmured thoughtfully. I'm sure it will all work out, just keep an eye out. I told him about you, by the way. Mentioned if he wanted a celestial spirit mage that wouldn't abuse him to seek out Lucy Hertfilia. Loke drained his glass, then reached across the table and tussled Lucy's hair teasingly. Don't give up on mastering Aquarius's powers. By you possessing them, that opens you up to one day mastering the star dress. Lucy shoved his hand away. What's that? It's where you team up with celestial spirits with whom you have a close bond and utilize their powers. You and I should work on it. I know losing Aquarius has been hard, but you still have me. And I talked to Virgo and Taurus. They'd like to try training you too. Loke stood from the table. Maybe after this mission. 
I would like that, Lucy said with a smile, feeling optimistic. And Loke, I really appreciate you. He flashed a debonair grin. Of course you do. The door to the dining car slid open, and Natsu walked inside with a huge yawn. He rubbed at his eyes sleepily until his gaze landed upon Lucy and Loke. Hey Lucy, Loke, Natsu greeted. Loke clapped his hand over Natsu's shoulder. Make sure she gets some sleep. She's a real grouch when she's trying to hide those bags under her eyes. Lucy tossed one of the unpeeled oranges at Loke's back, but he ducked and it hit Natsu squarely in the face. Natsu frowned and caught the orange as it began to fall. Lucy's bags are hardly her main problem when she's not sleeping. It's that temper of hers, he argued. I'm right here. Lucy cried out in annoyance. I leave her in your capable hands, Loke said before vanishing back into the celestial spirit world. Natsu slid into the booth across from Lucy. You okay? Lucy leaned back and eyed Natsu closely. He looked healthy. How are you not on the floor writhing with motion sickness? It helps when I don't look out any windows. Natsu smiled weakly, and Lucy noticed the slight pallor to his cheeks and strain at the corners of his eyes. I was just a little preoccupied and couldn't sleep. I was thinking about Aquarius and tracking down our families. Lucy sighed and pushed aside her plate. Loke says there's a new celestial spirit. Oh? Natsu asked, his face started to turn a sickly green. Maybe we should go back to our car and sleep. He stood and swayed on his feet. Lucy was quickly at his side and looped her arm around his waist to steady him. Okay, I'm not feeling so well. All right, let's go, Lucy said, helping him head back to their car. Natsu leaned his cheek against hers, his warm breath caressed over her face. The romantic moment was ruined when Lucy felt a trickle of Natsu's drool slide down her neck. Itachi felt no hunger, but seeing these leaf shinobi share in the camaraderie of meal time, he felt a longing for his lost friend Shisui. He closed his eyes and saw once again his last vision of his best friend Ilus and falling off a cliff to meet his death. Hey. Um, Reaper. Sakura called out from a few feet away. Itachi opened his eyes and turned towards her, careful to keep his features obscured. Are you okay? She asked. Sakura drew near, and he could feel the magnetic pull of his onyx key in her possession. I am beyond the subjective status of life, Itachi answered. Is there something you need? You didn't eat with us, I wanted to make sure you really aren't hungry and just trying to be tough, Sakura explained. She tucked a strand of pink hair behind her ear nervously. I do not hunger. Itachi turned back towards the western sky. I had thought my crows would have returned with information. It's a vast land. I'm sure they just have a lot of ground to cover, Sakura assured him. Are you a shinobi? Not anymore, Itachi answered. In my past, I was always loyal to my village. He turned towards her again. You have nothing to fear from me, Sakura Haruno. I am barely more than a ghost. Then maybe you can push back your hood, show us who you are. You obviously know us, Naruto said. He sniffed the air. I worked with a ghost before. He saved mine and B's life one time when we faced Nagato. Or should I just tell everyone else who you are? Karama and I never forget a smell. Then perhaps you should bathe more often, sighed Deadpan. Shut up, sigh, Naruto complained, playfully shoving his dark-haired teammate in the arm. You know who he is? Sakura asked. Her hand fell to her side where she kept the onyx key. I can tell you, he is on our side, Naruto said. He cocked his head to the side and pierced Itachi with his cerulean gaze. I'd rather you tell them though. I suppose there is no reason to continue this charade, Itachi said. He pushed back his hood, revealing his raven hair and eyes. Unlike in life, in death he could control his Sharingan eyes and see with perfect clarity. His skin wasn't as pale in this new form, but had a dark gray sheen. He was truly a creature of the shadows now. Sakura raised her hand against her lips in shock. Itachi, she whispered, her jade eyes wide with fear. Itachi nodded his head in acknowledgement. Once, I was Itachi Ichiha. I am now known as Reaper. He tugged his hood back in place, feeling exposed with it down. Naruto laid his hands over Sakura's shoulders. Remember, Itachi was always on our side. He was serving deep undercover following the third Hokage's orders. There was a rumor in route that Danzo tried to eliminate the entire Ichiha clan, so he could harvest their Sharingan eyes, Sai said after an uncomfortable silence fell amongst them. He could never control the Ichiha, and one particular shinobi, Shisui, especially frightened him. Shisui was capable of stopping the Ichiha revolt, but Danzo stole that chance by stealing his eye with the power of persuasion, Itachi said. Shisui found me and entrusted me with his other eye, one capable of breaking any mind control. Sai nodded. Danzo's bandaged eye was Shisui's eye. It makes sense. I always wondered how he got away with running rude against the Hokage's wishes. And eventually, Sasuke found true revenge by slaying Danzo and destroying all those Sharingan eyes, Itachi said. I am not returned to this earth to settle my past regrets. 
He stared into the distance and tried to hasten his crow's return with his will alone. Sakura recalled the details of Danzo's death. He had claimed the Hokage's title, while Tsunade was comatose, in spite of popular opinion favoring Kakashi. Shisui's persuasive eyes certainly explained that oddity. She had faced off with Sasuke shortly after he killed Danzo. He'd been about to kill his companion, Karen, when Sakura arrived. And Kami, Kakashi and Naruto had showed up in just the nick of time to save her from Sasuke's bloodlust. She reached up and patted Naruto's hands before shifting out and under his touch. Part of our mission is to find Sasuke. He is thought to have come to the Earth Country. At least, that's the rumor we're following, Sai said. He was the primary concern of my past life. I leave him to the three of you, Itachi said. He is not to know of my former identity. Itachi peered at the three of them with his dark, serious gaze. I am here to stop the Morgan. We understand, Naruto said, laying hands on one of Sakura and Sai's upper arms and squeezing firmly, zinging them with the Nine Tails Chakra briefly. They both nodded in agreement and he released them. Sai sat low to style on the ground and pulled out a scroll. He opened a fresh bottle of ink and spilled the ink over the paper. He activated a jutsu that allowed the ink rats he had created earlier to show him what they had discovered. The ink began to rearrange itself into the form of a camp, along with images of recognizable Earth shinobi. That's them, Sakura said, pointing to two of the shinobi in the center of the illustrated camp, a slim tall female and a large bulky male. That's the appointed Tsuchikage, Kuritsuchi and her father, Katsuchi. It does match the description, Naruto agreed. How far? 30 kilometers north, Sai said. Itachi only half listened to the squad's discussion. His attention was on the distant horizon as he could finally feel the return of one of his ravens. As the crow came closer, Itachi's mind was flooded with the images and sounds his avatar experienced. The Morrigan, a foul hag that enchanted mortal men, wasn't half a day's journey in the northwest. She had a dark figure enslaved to her will that led the violence of her conquest of the lands. His power was greater than the average shinobi, and he sparked true fear into the hearts of the around him. Another man, someone of Earth, led troops to partake in bloodshed and the capturing of slaves with great revelry. What did you see? Naruto asked, standing in front of Itachi and waving his hand in front of his face to attract his attention. The Morgan is in the northwest. I suggest if you do not want the rightful Tsuchikage to be slaughtered that we intervene soon, Itachi said. Anything else? Dust impressions, Itachi said, not wanting to voice his concern that the dark figure in his vision was none other than Sasuke. We should send some shadow clones, Sakura suggested. Naruto nodded. Good idea, now that we know which direction. He clenched his hand into a fist and hit it against his thigh in anticipation. This will be over in a day or two, and then we'll track down Sasuke. Itachi clenched his jaw, but said nothing of his suspicion upon Sasuke's whereabouts. We should head out now, before the Morgan intercepts the Earth Shinobi. Welcome to the squad, Reaper. Sakura held out her hand, and Itachi stared down at it for a moment. Sai and Naruto laid their hands of top of hers. I've not been part of an Anbu squad since my time on row with Kakashi, Itachi murmured. I mostly perform solo missions. As Kakashi's other teammates, we welcome you to our squad, Naruto said. He nodded his chin towards their joined hands. This is highly unprofessional, Itachi said with a sigh as he added his hand to the top of their pile. It's a new world, Naruto assured him, as they retracted their hands. It's the same world, Sai corrected. He looked over toward Sakura and shook his head. Are you sure that he passed the academy? He was dead last, Sakura said, jabbing her elbow playfully into Naruto's ribs. And he's going to be our next Hokage, Sai said. Just as someone has to be first, another has to be last. We're all shinobi in the end, Itachi said. Oh, so you're a shinobi again now? Sakura asked. Itachi gave her a curt nod. As I've been recruited to your squad and you currently possess my key, for the time being, I am a shinobi of Konoha. In the easternmost border of the Pergrant Kingdom, their benefactor lived in a huge mansion. The hallways were lined with tapestries, Persian rugs were scattered across the marble stones, samurai armor, as well as medieval armor from the west lined the long stretches of corridors. Nikolai Berezin was obviously a rich man. For an eccentric rider, he sure seems to make a good income, Lucy murmured. No kidding, Gray agreed. Maybe he inherited his fortune and then decided to take up riding. Happy sniffed the air and held his hands over his stomach as it growled loudly. I just hope he has some fish. I'm so hungry. Don't let down your guard, Urza said. And don't mention the fish, Happy. Natsu reached out to touch an intricate vase with a golden dragon etched across the alabaster, but stopped abruptly when Urza's warning glare caught his eye. He retracted his hand and cleared his throat as they waited for an audience with Nikolai Berezin. The master will see you now, Nikolai's butler, Anton, said. He opened a huge oak door and led the fairy tale mages into a massive library. 
Countless books lined the walls, and a huge rectangular table took up the center of the room. Nikolai sat at the head of the table with many scrolls piled up around him. The master of the mansion was a short rot unman. He wore an expensive charcoal-colored suit, diamonds as cufflinks, and his head was clean-shaven. Thank you, Anton, he said. Have a seat, he said, gesturing to the empty seats around his table. Bray and Lucy sat on either side of the benefactor. Natsu sat next to Lucy, Happy stood on the table in front of Natsu, and Urza sat at the foot of the table facing Bears indirectly. The strongest, most famous team in fairy tale the champions of the Grand Magic Games. Nikolai greeted. I am Nikolai Berezin. I know exactly who each of you are. His dark eyes roved over the team. You paid an extravagant price to interview us, Urza said. Nikolai waved away her concern. My family made their fortune as merchants. Another article I'm working on is the extraordinary violent civil war in the country to the east of this kingdom Awagakur. He laced his fingers together and laid his hands over his prominent belly. You are right to be suspicious. The real reason I wanted to hire mages from the strongest guild in Earthland was to hire them to help my nephew. Who is your nephew? Lucy asked. Benny's, my sister, died tragically ten years ago from pneumonia. Twenty years ago, she married a shinobi of Awagakur, and her husband is the leader of the rebel faction. My nephew is only 17 years old. He shouldn't be involved in such a violent ordeal. Why is your brother in Laura Belling? Gray asked. I assume you know given the nature of your Civil War article. The leader of the Shinobi Nation is to be based on a consensus of the Shinobi. However, before the third Suchikage died, he decided to name his granddaughter an inexperienced young woman to be his successor, Nikolai explained. According to my Mikhail, the people voted for his father, Kasai Arashi. Frankly, I don't really care which side wins. I wanted to hire the very best to make sure that my nephew makes it out alive. That's why I solicited the victors of the Grand Magic Games. I've not heard anything from Mikhail in weeks. It's not unusual for a delay in communication during times of war, Lucy pointed out. Nikolai snatched a silk handkerchief from the front pocket of his suit and dabbed at his eyes. Please, bring my nephew back home to me. Before she died, my sister made me swear that her husband's aspirations wouldn't lead to their son's downfall. I was to do everything within my power to protect Mikhail. Trust in us, we'll find Mikhail and bring him back to you. Natsu promised. I was hoping you'd say that, Nikolai said. He shoved one of the scrolls in front of Lucy and Gray. Here's a map of the region as best my resources could decide with the most up-to-date information on true placement of rebel forces and the illegal government. Isn't there an Earth Daimyo? Lucy asked. She had read quite a few books about the lands in the east. It was a secretive land full of ninjas. Shouldn't he be involved in settling the dispute? The daimyo keeps separate from the military, Nikolai explained. He uses the ninja to keep his borders safe, but stays out of the affairs of ruling the ninja clans. To him, the ninja are just tools to be used. No one should be considered a tool, Urza said firmly. Thirty kilometers north of the raised village rested the camp of the Yandame Tsuchikage's forces. There were several guards at the border of the area and numerous makeshift tents. According to the observations of Itachi's ravens and size Inc. spies that reported to them, the Earth Village was full of civilians, as the shinobi had split into two distinct parties. Alt, who goes there? State your business, one of the Iwagakur shinobi demanded, sword held at the ready. He was very tall, his posture slightly hunched from fatigue. We've come from Kanoha, Naruto answered. Our Hokage received word of the Tsuchikage's distress. We are here to offer aid to settle this dispute with as little bloodshed as possible. The shinobi lowered his sword and gaped at Naruto open-mouthed. The guard next to him, a short and stocky man, elbowed him in the ribs. The tall shinobi closed his mouth abruptly and shook his head. I can't believe it. It's the Naruto Uzumaki. No way. How can you tell? The stocky guard asked. He's got one of those Anbu masks on. Look at his hair. The tall guard said, pointing towards Naruto. He then pointed towards Sakura and Sai. And that pink hair. That must be Sakura Haruno. And the dark-haired one. I think that's Sasuke Ichiha. I am not Sasuke Ichiha, Sai growled in annoyance. Itachi hid a slight smile behind the safety of his cloak's hood. You do favor him, he said quietly. If you don't mind, we wear the masks to hide our identity, Sakura said to the two guards. Then you two might want to do something about your hair. Not too many blonde and pink-haired shinobi, the stocky guard answered. Especially traveling together from Kanoha. He has a valid point, Itachi said. Might I suggest a simple jinjutsu to alter your appearance? It might be prudent to do so before we venture farther. If you want to be trusted, you should stay as you are. Most squads have someone that can see past Jinjutsu and it will be suspicious, the tall guard argued. Besides, everyone knows the heroes of the Great War. You might have to sign a few autographs while you're here, he joked. He pointed towards Sai. 
If you're not that itchaha brat, you must be Sai. Is it true that the pictures and words you draw come to life? It is an ability of mine, Sai answered. Though I wouldn't call it life so much as artificial animation. May we speak with Itsuchikage? Sakura asked, interrupting her teammate before he got caught up in a lengthy explanation. We'd like to report some of the violence we've seen along our journey. Sure, the tall guard agreed. I'll have my clone escort you there. He gestured to the Anbu members. You'll especially need to explain how you entered the Earth country with the rebel forces so heavily concentrated at the borders. Our companion as well, Sakura pressed. He'll be joining us. I'm afraid we can't allow that, the stocky guard said. We know you three, but we cannot allow a masked man to enter. You will remember how well that worked out for us the last time we let a masked man into our midst. It's fine, Sakura, Itachi said quietly. Sakura and Naruto exchanged looks. He shrugged, indicating the choice was up to her on this mission. You two go, I'll stay with our companion, she decided. Naruto laid his hand over Sakura's shoulder and nodded as he and Sai followed the tall guard's clone inside the Tsuchikage's camp. The two posted guards eyed Itachi curiously. Is he Sasuke Chiha? The tall one asked. Sakura smiled behind her mask. I'm not at liberty to share my friend's identity. You may call me Reaper, Itachi said. That's an ominous name, the stocky guard said with a scowl. He directed his dark green gaze toward Sakura. Though, just in case, you might want to consider dyeing your hair a less conspicuous color. They have these dyes that wash out. He tugged on one of his medium brown locks of hair. That's how I hide my gray. Even the best at detecting Jinjutsus wouldn't see past this disguise, he added with a wink. Thanks for the tip, Sakura said. She grabbed Itachi's elbow. We'll just scout around the periphery and make sure there aren't any rebel factions trying to start any trouble. I don't want to distract you from your duty. Be our guest, the tall guard said. You might want to be on the lookout for the Magaki group. They've been making a lot of trouble lately. I'm familiar with them, Sakura said. She tugged on Itachi's elbow and drew him away from the Tsuchikage's camp. I sense an uneasiness in the atmosphere, Itachi murmured once they were out of earshot of the Earth Ninja guards. Those fools were rather inept at allowing foreign shinobi to enter their campground. It's no wonder that Dadara made such a fool out of them those years ago. You respected him? Sakura asked. He was amusing, Itachi said. He chuckled softly. His ridiculous art. His posture stiffened. Death is coming. He pointed to the northwest where a large dust cloud had begun to rise. Rock rain? Sakura asked. We're too far west, Itachi said. It's the same feeling from the raised village. Sakura rubbed her hand over her knuckles in anticipation. Then let's go and say hello, shall we? A couple of Itachi's ravens swooped towards them, landing on his shoulder and then melting into his dark cloak. He tried to smother his emotions at the knowledge he gained from his familiars. There laid a small village in that direction, and it had been attacked. The ravens had been unable to escape the dark will of the death goddess that ordered the slaughter. It had only been the release of a certain summons that allowed them to escape. There is a large snake. Like Rachimaru's snake. Sakura asked with a helpful tremor to her voice. Could it be? After all these years of searching was Sasuke so close? Itachi nodded. But not his, he confirmed. Keep the key safe. He grabbed Sakura around the waist, and then they vanished into a cloud of dark smoke, appearing several kilometers away and near the commotion causing the dust cloud. Sakura felt the world spin around her as her feet settled on the ground. She could feel her chakra rushing through her veins as she geared up for the impending fight. There was a giant snake in the back with hundreds of rebel forces in the front. They're mad, she realized, observing them kill any animal that crossed their path and stepping upon any fellow ninja that might have stumbled, crushing the unfortunate individuals. A few of the surviving villagers managed to escape, only to be hunted down by the massive army. Berserk, Itachi corrected. He rolled back his shoulders, and his scythe materialized in his hand. He gripped the handle tightly in anticipation. I can smell the stench of death upon them. The rebel forces were quickly upon them, and Sakura and Itachi fought back to back. She recognized several members of the Magaki group. Sakura did her best to render them unconscious with precisely placed chakra blades, a technique that she and Shizune had perfected after witnessing Kabuto's skill. She used her fists to cause some concussions to put many others out of commission for the foreseeable future. Itachi swung his scythe. It didn't kill unless he willed it to do so, but it did drain the chakra of any foe he swept it through, without causing any physical harm. Andy, Sakura said, catching her breath. The civilians ran past them and towards the Tsuchikage's camp. Ninja from the Tsuchikage's forces began to arrive on the front lines with Sakura and Itachi. Naruto and Sai rushed into the fray at the other end from them, allowing more civilians to escape the melee. Itachi felt his strength start to fade, and an aggressive force began to pull him back to the spirit world. Just over the hill to the west he spotted a familiar shock of orange hair. 
Sakura, Itachi whispered in a hoarse voice. He grabbed Sakura's arm and she turned towards him. I'm being forced to return to the other world. You must use the key to summon me back. How? Isn't there someone we can ask about these things? Sakura asked. She squinted. You're starting to be partially transparent. Sakura's healing hands rushed to brush back his hair from his forehead. You're burning up too. I think if you stay too long here you'll weaken yourself like with chakra exhaustion. Lo, Curlio, as the one that told me a little about this role as a celestial spirit, Itachi said. He closed his eyes to fight a wave of dizziness as the image of the rocky landscape around them was superimposed over the lush green forest of the spirit world. He wasn't sure if the loke he saw in the distance was in the human world or the spirit world. Find Lucy Hertfilia. She'll know how to summon me back using that key. The Tachi vanished from their realm without another word. Sakura stared at the space he had occupied dumbfounded for a moment. She turned to avoid an attack but found herself frozen as a strong fist hit against her solar plexus. The air was knocked out of her lungs and she stumbled back, only to be knocked against an invisible wall of frigid air. The dark fog began to form around her. She struggled to see past the dense darkness to no avail. It became difficult to breath as the air grew thick with oppression. You shouldn't have come, a raspy, woman's voice came from her left. Sakura used a great deal of energy to move her arm and whip out a kunai. She struggled to hold it defensively, not thrusting the chakra in her fists to combat the powerful dark force. Who are you? You have taken my prey, the voice hissed from Sakura's right now. I am the goddess of death. It is my right to paint the earth with blood. Who are you to interfere? Icy fingers seemed to clutch at Sakura's throat. She tried to pry them away, but they were insubstantial. Her air supply was cut off and she started to panic as her lungs began to starve for oxygen. We had a deal, Sasuke barked. His tall, lithe form was suddenly around Sakura. His strong arms encircled her shoulders as he held her against him, the icy fingers retreated abruptly. What are you doing here? He whispered against Sakura's ear. You have no idea the danger you're in. Mission, Sakura choked out. She drank in the sight of Sasuke with greedy eyes. His skin had an unhealthy pallor, but otherwise, he looked fine if not slightly annoyed. You're alive. I'd hardly call this living, Sasuke scoffed. His dark gaze looked Sakura up and down, and she felt naked under his penetrating stare. He ripped off her Anbu mask with the fox-like caricature on it. She is an immortal creature that feeds on war, pain, and death. He hugged Sakura against him and lifted her into his arms and jumped away from the ground just in time to avoid the sickening thud of a deadly avalanche from a cacophony of Earth-style jutsus by the rebel army. The dark fog began to draw close again. I'd apologize, but I have no choice. It's for your own good, Sasuke said. He hit the back of Sakura's neck with the side of his hand and she fell unconscious against him. The fog lingered, uncertain around them. I claim this one for my own spoils, Morgan. The darkness growled unhappily and took the form of a massive dark green dog. Michaela Rashi. Are you here? A loud-mouthed pink-haired man shouted. He opened his mouth again and unleashed a wave of violent fire. Michaela Rashi. Try to be a bit more discreet, you idiot. A dark-haired man shouted back before he unleashed a fury of ice daggers between the rebel army and the approaching followers of Kuritsuchi. Magicians, Morgan hissed. Retreat, my prince of death. Sasuke gripped Sakura closely and closed his eyes to speak with Aota. The huge snake summons curled around the rebel army, and Sasuke opened his eyes and using the power of his Ichiha bloodline, teleported the entire four several kilometers north. Sakura. A nearby masked man with blonde hair screamed in anguish. What the hell is going on? Natsu growled. He kicked the ground in frustration at the sudden disappearance of half the fight. No one answered my question. Maybe you can answer some of ours then, a dark-haired woman with an authoritative air asked. The remaining fighters flanked around her protectively. We're from the fairy tale guild, Urza explained. We're here on a mission to track down the nephew of our benefactor. Michaela Rashi. The dark-haired woman guessed. Wow, lady, you're really smart. Happy said with a pleased flap of his wings as he hovered near Natsu's shoulder. She's no lady, cat, a burly man with a bulbous nose warned. You were speaking with the yandame Tsuchikage, Kuritsuchi Kamizuru. It's okay, Akatsuchi, Kuritsuchi said. I've heard of these mage guilds of the far west. I've just never heard of one coming so far east that they enter our lands. Is he here? Natsu asked. We have other business to get to, so we'd really like to return Mikhail to his uncle and be on our way. Natsu, calm down, Lucy said, laying her hand over his forearm. We have plenty of time to finish our personal business, she whispered. Something is very wrong here. You're right something is wrong here, the blonde masked man said. He jerked his mask up revealing prominent whisker markings across his cheeks and crouched near the ground. He picked up an abandoned mask. Two of our teammates just vanished. 
I'm sorry, Naruto, truly, Kuritsuchi said, her dark eyes sorrowful. I need to help my citizens, but I can spare a few good ninja to help you. Her lips thinned in frustration. This isn't the first time I've seen these rebels snatch up people and vanish into thin air. I appreciate the offer, Naruto said. We can track them faster on our own. Kuritsuchi nodded. She looked past him towards the fairy tale mages. Kitsuchi, if you'll speak with these mages. Of course, Yandame Tsuchikij, another tall, brawny man answered. Kuritsuchi sighed. It's okay if you call me by my first name, Dad, she chided. Kitsuchi shook his head stubbornly. No, thank you Yandame. That wouldn't be right. He stared at the fairy tale mages expectantly. Bray, you and I will talk with him, Urza ordered taking charge of the situation. She turned towards Lucy, Natsu, Happy, and Loke. Help these two find their missing teammates. We'll catch up. Natsu stared at Naruto, sensing a kindred spirit. You're Naruto. Yeah, and this is Sai, Naruto said, gesturing towards his silent companion. The masks are supposed to conceal our identity, Sai said with a sigh. He pushed his mask up as well. From what I saw, it looked like Reaper vanished about a minute before Sakura. Reaper? Loke asked. He turned to Lucy, his eyes wide behind his glasses. I thought I saw him. He's the missing celestial spirit I told you about. I'll be back when I can Lucy. I'm going to check the spirit world and see if I can find him. Call if you need me. He vanished with a pop. Naruto stared down at his friend's mask in his hand. It had to have been Sasuke. He's grown very powerful if he can teleport so many people. He tucked the mask into the pack on his hip. He won't hurt her. Sai scoffed. Are we talking about the same Sasuke? Naruto moved his hands into a rapid series of motions, and dozens of clones appeared around them. They scattered into different directions. What's the personal business that brought you here? He turned towards Natsu and Lucy. Um, well, we were looking for our distant relatives in the country of fire, Lucy explained. We're from Fiori. It's one of the westernmost countries of Earthland. Oh? Naruto and Sai exchanged looks. That sounds pretty far away, Naruto said. We are from the country of fire, Sai said. Who are your relations? She's looking for the Namikazes, and I'm trying to track down my uncle Kizashi Haruno, Natsu said. Naruto started to laugh. What's so funny? Happy asked in irritation. They are both orphans looking for their long-lost family. You shouldn't laugh. What a strange little cat, Sai said. He reached out to poke Happy in the belly, and the exceed giggled. Naruto shook his head. I'm laughing because I'm Naruto Yuzumaki, son of Minato Namikaze, he explained. You found me. Wow, I didn't think we'd find you so easily, Lucy said. She smiled at the blonde and held out her hand. Naruto stared down at her hand. He reached out and shook it briefly. Unfortunately, one of our missing teammates is Sakura Haruno. He turned to Natsu. You both have pink hair. Natsu grinned broadly. What are we waiting around for? I'm fired up. Let's go get her back. No point in rushing off without a known direction, Naruto protested. That's why I sent out the clones. What about Reaper? How do you know him? Lucy asked. Naruto and Sai exchanged looks once more. What do you know about him? Lucy held up her keys. I'm a celestial spirit mage, and he's a celestial spirit. He's more than a celestial spirit, Naruto said quietly. He stared off into the distance with a look of frustration. He sat on the grass and assumed the lotus position. He closed his eyes and started to meditate. A vibrant yellow glow enveloped his body. What's he doing? Natsu asked curiously. He could sense the strength in Lucy's lost relative, but it was different than dragon slayer magic. He grinned. He'd really like to fight with a blonde and test his strength, but he'd have to be patient not his strong suit. Sage mode, Sai explained. That doesn't mean anything to me, Happy complained. He looked longingly towards the camp where Urza and Grey went. I'm so hungry. What's Sakura like? Natsu asked Sai. Strong and temperamental, Sai answered. Naruto's eyes opened, and his pupils were in the shape of a cross, a horizontal and vertical slit intersecting in the center. We should go north. Once more in the spirit world, Itachi sat on a large boulder, with his hood pushed back and staring into the distance. His legs were crossed lotus style, and he held his hands over his knees. He kept his breathing even and controlled. He spent most of his life meditating and channeling his chakra. Surely, he could master his new essence. He was stuck in this accursed magical realm. Itachi could feel the crows back on the plane of earth, but he could not return to them. He struggled to feel a connection to his onyx key and to wherever Sakura might be, but he only sensed a vague tug in his core. The sounds of tree nymphs giggling in the nearby woods grated on his nerves. How was he to concentrate with such distractions? It takes years to build the energy reserves required to self-summon, Leo said, stepping out of the forest's edge. I cannot leave them in such peril, Itachi grumbled. Who were they? Leo asked. 
I saw you moments before you returned to this realm. Allies against a great evil, Itachi answered. The necromancer was a wretched man, but he introduced Itachi to a villain unlike any he'd seen as a shinobi, an enraged goddess was uniquely terrifying. And the longer he stayed in the spirit world, the more lives she endangered. It became obvious that the lion spirit had no intention of leaving, so Itachi gave him his full attention. Perhaps he might even be useful. Leo folded his arms over his chest and stared at him with an imperious air. And your summoning key. Safe. Leo scoffed. You did not give it to Lucy Hertfilia, Reaper. How can you be sure it is safe? I simply know, Itachi said. I gave it to an ally one of my former life and now in this one. You were in the company of humans from your mortal life? Leo asked in shock. He ran his fingers through his unruly fiery hair. A hundred years passed between my mortal life and my first summoning. Time does pass differently between the realms, Itachi said. You risk your life staying away from the spirit realm for too long. You haven't the experience or energy reserved to stay so long in the human world. Leo started to pace, shoving his hands into his pockets. The key is useless without the skill of a celestial spirit mage to summon you. I will learn to summon myself, Itachi said. Well I am glad for you that you like your contractor, I have no intention of making a contract with her. I trust the woman that has my key. Do you now? Leo asked. He stalked towards Itachi's boulder. Is she your lover? He grinned. The ladies of the mortal land are what makes my days worthwhile. 1. She's not my lover. 2. I would hope that you have more satisfaction in life than numerous conquests, Itachi sneered in disgust. There is a very serious danger and I need to return so that I can stop it. Leo started to laugh. You cannot seriously believe that the fate of the world relies on your participation. I can assure you, as long as fairy tale is around, the world is safe. Your mages are no match for a goddess of death, Itachi warned. What do you mean? Goddess of death. Leo asked. I am the Reaper. Do you not think it a coincidence that a goddess of death should appear and cause murderous havoc? Itachi demanded. If you cannot teach me how I might increase my powers and summon myself, then be gone. It simply takes time, Leo said. He ran his hands through his hair again. Maybe I can speak with the spirit king, find out what's going on. You're not an usual celestial spirit. Maybe he knew something about this threat. Better yet, I will solicit an audience with the spirit king. You return to the mortal realm and find out what is happening, Itachi said. Surely, you are not the only spirit that can self-summon. Well, Virgo does it quite often too, but I'm not sure, Leo trailed off. Take me to Virgo and then you return, Itachi ordered. Leo narrowed his eyes. I don't take orders from you, Reaper. I am the king of the Zodiacs. And I am something else entirely, Itachi warned. I cannot believe how stupid you can be, a deep frustrated voice whispered. Something cool pressed against Sakura's forehead, and she slowly opened her eyes. She was in some sort of cave with only one bright lantern in the corner illuminating it. Sasuke was leaning over her, his brow furrowed in either concern or annoyance probably the latter. Sakura lifted her hand to brush her fingers against his cheek. Her arm felt like it was made of lead for the effort. His skin was warm and his face more angular than it used to be. It's really you. Her mouth was so dry, it felt like cotton. Of course it's me, Sasuke huffed, dropping the wet cloth he had pressed against her. He reached up and clasped her hand, pulling it away from his face. He stood up and walked towards the far wall. I'll get you some water. Sakura reached for Itachi's onyx key and sighed with relief at the solid stone. We've been worried about you. Sasuke came back and crouched next to her, holding a canteen to her. Drink. She drank the water, trying to pace herself so that she wouldn't be sick. Sasuke stared back at her with his dark unreadable eyes. You realize you screwed everything up by showing up. Sorry to inconvenience you, Sakura scolded. She sat up abruptly, knocking her forehead against his in the process. Sasuke rubbed his head and frowned. You're not an inconvenience, he hissed. You were supposed to stay away. I knew you would come eventually, but I needed you to stay away at least until I figured out how to stop her. I guess the lack of letters should have been my first clue, Sakura said. She narrowed her eyes and focused her healing chakra to soothe Sasuke's bruise without ever touching him. The Hokage sent us on a mission to investigate the bloody civil war in Earth. What are you doing here? After everything that happened, I wouldn't have thought you would betray us again and go rogue. He gripped both her upper arms with his hands and shook her gently. I didn't betray you. I would never put you, Naruto or Kakashi through that again. Then why are you here? She could feel her eyes water and she hated her weakness. Why was she always so emotional when it came to Sasuke? She'd rather be angry and busting something down with her fist. She didn't have time to cry like a whiny adolescent. Sasuke released one of her arms with his true hand and ran his coarse thumb under her eye, brushing away one of her tears. I'm here because there is something more terrible and powerful than Kagaya, he said quietly. 
you know how Itachi was a double agent. He worked within the Akatsuki to keep worse things from happening. I'm having to do the same thing. It's not the same thing, Sasuke, Sakura whispered. Itachi's mission was sanctioned by the Hokage. Kakashi knows nothing about this. Sasuke's thumb traced over her cheekbone, and then he swept his fingers through her hair, cupping the back of her head, angling her face to look up at him. Except, I'm not doing it for the village. I'm doing it for you. You and Naruto. I knew eventually Kakashi would send the best out here, and you two are the best. I'm stalling until we can defeat her. We defeated one evil goddess, we can do it again. We saw some of the destruction this goddess has caused, Sakura said. Morgan is the goddess of death, war, and strife, Sasuke said. She stirs up trouble where there is already unrest. Iwagakur was a breeding ground for discontent with the rival factions for Tsuchikage. He leaned close so that his forehead was pressed gently against hers. Why were you so far away from the others? You know the importance of keeping in a tight formation. Was he really lecturing her about teamwork? How much should she tell him about Itachi? It felt wrong to keep it from him, but she promised Itachi. I had a partner, but he vanished. Vanished? He narrowed his eyes. Did he teleport? No, he has powers. He calls himself Reaper. He's trying to stop this death goddess. He's a celestial spirit, she explained. Sasuke released his hold on her and rocked back on heels. I have no idea what you're talking about. A celestial what? Why would you partner up with an unknown? That's very dangerous, Sakura. Sakura chortled out a laugh at the hypocrisy. You're the one working for an evil goddess. And our interests were in alignment. It made more sense to work together for a common goal. She sighed and reached for his hands, surprisingly, he let her hold them. What do we do now? I can't let you out of my sight, Sasuke said. I claimed you as my spoils. I don't need you to babysit me. Sakura frowned. And I'm not spoils of some war. She would kill you in a heartbeat, Sasuke said. He squeezed her hands and then released her before standing up and staring down at her. She wants to, but in order to keep me in her service, she knows not to harm you. Arashi is another matter. He'd love to kill you to get to me. He considers us rivals for the goddess's affections. I can't help you kill people, Sakura said, standing in front of him. She had to crane her head back to meet his gaze. You're a poison expert. Maybe you can create a massive poison to temporarily create a false death, Sasuke suggested. It doesn't work that way. You're the one that apprenticed with Orochimaru. You know more about poisons than I do. Sakura stared down at her hands. She was supposed to heal people, not harm them. Shizun taught me what she could, but I've no idea of something that can be used on that large of a scale. Sasuke breathed in deeply. They call me Hawk. They don't know who I am, though of course I'm suspect. Your hair is too recognizable. You'll have to dye it. Sakura reached up and tugged at the ends of her pink hair. I don't care if they know who I am. They'll figure it out soon enough. And maybe you just think they don't know who you are. You're infamous, Sasuke Cha. He smiled at her. You always had a gift to see past even the most elaborate Jinjutsus, Sakura. That's part of the reason I love you. You were always able to see beyond my bullshit. But, so far, you've been the only person to see beyond my illusion. Just as I can see beyond the goddess's illusion. To others she appears as a beautiful enchantress. I see her as the wicked crone that she is. Sakura gaped at him. He just spoke more words to her at one time than ever before, and within the midst of it, he confessed his love. You love me? Sasuke scowled. I thought it was obvious, Sakura. He turned his back on her and hurried to a pack in the back corner of the room and started to shuffle through it. Where are we? I thought this was a cave, but now I'm not so sure, she said. Your affinity is to water and earth, you should be able to figure it out, Sasuke muttered. Ah, he said, pulling out a bottle of ink in his pack. I had this for writing you letters, but kept it just in case. It will do. Sakura closed her eyes and channeled her chakra into the ground beneath her. They were underground and while it was a cave, it wasn't a natural cave. You carved this out yourself. You always were smart, Sasuke said. He held the bottle of black ink. Do you want to do it, or should I? Lucy stared down at the strange ink creature she was writing. She was sharing the magical creature with her newly discovered cousin, while Natsu did his best not to puke on Sai on whom he shared an ink bird. I don't feel right about leaving Grey and Urza behind, Lucy said softly. I left behind a couple of shadow clones with them, Naruto assured her. They'll tell them what's going on. They can join us later. Yeah, well, it will take them a while since they don't have flying transportation, Lucy grumbled. The ink bird began to dip down towards the earth, and Lucy clutched onto Naruto's waist in a near panic. She didn't like flying, and she liked falling even less. She squeezed her eyes shut and hoped that they'd be on the ground soon. As she pressed her face against Naruto's back she wrinkled her nose. How can someone smell so strongly of ramen noodles? She hated ramen noodles. 
There was a time when she'd gone a month without any work for the guild and had to subside on ramen noodles for most of her meals. It had been a terrible month and it had taken some serious workout sessions to lose the 15 pounds she gained from the ordeal. So, when we finish up this mission and head home I'll show you around. You've got to eat at Ichiraku Ramen. It's the best ramen in the world. I'm not that big of a ramen fan actually, Lucy said. Though, we just need to find one boy amongst a rebel army. It shouldn't take too long. She touched the keys on her belt absently. I look forward to seeing the homeland of my mother's ancestors. Naruto looked down at her keys and frowned. Why do you have so many keys? I just keep the key to my apartment under the floor mat. I use them to fight, Lucy answered. She hurried towards Natsu's side as he slid off Sai's ink bird. She caught him by the shoulders as he groaned. Are you okay? Natsu shook his head, his eyes glazed over for a moment before they cleared up. Fine, now that I'm on solid ground. He brushed her hands off him and looked around. His gaze settled to an area up ahead. That's where the camp is. Yes, Sai agreed. I landed us here so that their scouts might not see us, though a spied troops not too far away on the other side of the hill. Don't you think it might be easier to see giant birds in the sky than an army on the ground, Lucy argued. I'm ready for some company, Natsu said with a cheeky grin. And we're about to have it, Naruto said. A dust cloud formed over the hill in front of them as the sound of troops marching towards them drew near. He looked towards Lucy. I leave some shadow clones with you for protection. Lucy's tough, Natsu assured him. She can handle herself. While Lucy appreciated the vote of confidence, she couldn't help but feel nervous. A sudden chill raced down her spine something very bad approached. At the peak of the hill a green dog stood. It stared down at them and howled. Never seen a dog like that, Naruto said with a frown. This was part one. Comment down below for the last part. For now, you guys should watch this video. Click on it and enjoy. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel if I make your time enjoyable. See you all in the last part.